The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're coming to you live from house. And I'm wearing a hat because I shaved my head over the week. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. Uh, so there we go. We'll have a reveal later on. Uh, but anyway, thrilled to be here with you on this uh, wonderful Tuesday morning. I hope you guys all had a wonderful, restful, respectful Memorial Day weekend and that you've come back refreshed and recharged. I know we loved how many of you tuned in and watched our wonderful T Dr. Temple Grandin Marathon, our first ever, but I think our annual uh, Dr. Temple Grandin Marathon because it, so many of you tuned in. I apologize that some of you did not realize that it, wa it wasn't live. And so you got, there was one person in particular who kept writing in saying, why are you not answering my question? And I felt terrible about that. But um, as always, you can write to me and let me know what your questions are. And if you have a, if you have a specific question, for Dr. Grant, and we do have her on a regular basis and I do bank them someplace. And so you can write in and ask me whatever the question is. And at some point I will make sure that we get it to Dr. Grant. So, which brings me to my next thing that there are lots of ways for you to ask a question. There are lots of ways for you to connect with us. So Traven's gonna show you uh, a graphic with uh, a bunch of different things that will show you ways to connect. And while he does that, I want to remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com, and when you go there, lots of things to do, but one of them is that you can write in in the chat, it's free, totally anonymous, it's at the bottom of the page, so that's www.autism-live.com, plus you can watch our whole playlist of, of Ask Dr. Doreen's, you can watch the whole playlist of uh, Ask Dr. Temple Grandin. You could watch all the cooking recipes and they're all segmented by, you know, topics, but all the videos that we've done in the last nine years are there. And so you can search them by topic and you can search them, you know, by, um, you know, the main word. I don't know what the word is. It's Tuesday. I've had a couple of days off and I shaved my head. So forgive me. Um, but anyway, here are some of the ways that you can connect. If you look uh, on the bottom is autism-live.com. We're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But on the left-hand column are all the places that we are live, which is Twitter, Facebook, Periscope, YouTube, right? And on the other side are all the places that we podcast to later. But for, for most of the places that we're live, we're also there recorded as well. So, but if you want to listen to us, you can listen on iTunes, Spot, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or Deezer. And you also have the choice on iTunes that you can download. It'll ask you, there's a place where you can click a little button um, if you want the full show with picture and sound, or if you just want sound. The hat's getting hot. It's coming off any second now. All right. Uh, so I'm very excited this morning because we've got a big show to kick it off. I feel like even though it's not summer, it's the unofficial begin of, beginning of summer. So I was trying to be kind of beachy with my wear today. And then I have a winter hat on because that's all I could grab at the last second. But as I said, that's coming off in a minute. I like to remind you at the start of the show that I am not an expert in autism. Oh, no. <laughs> no, my friends. I'm just the crazy lady, crazy lady who shaves her head. And I'm a parent. I'm a mom of an individual who was diagnosed with autism uh, at a very early age, two and a half, and we had the best of all possible uh, opportunities, and we got the best ABA, um, and I'm just, you know, so happy with the outcome that we had. We, as a friend says, we won the autism lottery. Uh, we worked really hard. I have to, you know, we had this opportunity, which was luck, pure luck, but then we worked our tuchuses off, and most especially he worked his tuchus off, 
And we had great, great experts. In fact, it was the folks at CARD. That's why I speak so lovingly of them, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. But I, you know, I made a deal, like, I don't know, um, right before we found CARD, like the night before we found CARD, I said, you know, please help me to help my child. And if you help me to help my child, I promise I will do whatever I, whatever it is that, you, you know, that needs to be done. And I promise I will turn around and help whoever I can. So, uh, hey, Jenna, saying hello to you. Um, and uh, so here I am, you know, my kid got help and I made a deal. I made a promise and one I'm very happy to keep, right? Uh, paying down that karmic debt. But I'm not an expert. I'm, I, I like to call people up and ask them to be on the show. And man, have I got an expert for you uh, this morning. And then I've got some fun for you. So all of that coming up in just a little while. But don't, don't mistake me for an expert. Not that you would with the crazy hat. Um, you would never, ever, my glasses are a little crooked. Uh, okay, it's time because it's so hot. All right, you ready for this? So I shaved my head. Uh, <laughs> and now it's made worse by the hat. Now I just look like a crazy person. Uh, yeah, well, it'll, you know what, it's hair and it will grow back. Um, that's, but uh, <laughs> Carrie Mallory Thompson posted a picture of her son's summer, very short haircut yesterday. I said, oh, I got the same haircut. And she said, you did not, your hair is short, but it's not that short. And I said, girl, you better tune in this morning because, uh, yeah, and now it, I had it a little sculpted so that it didn't look at, quite as crazy. And and then the hat ruined that. So there we go. It's not important. Um, but uh, we'd like to, hi, hey, Ivani. Good morning. How are you? Uh, we like to uh, start off the show on Tuesdays with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. And this is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to figure out what in the hey, nani, nani, are the experts talking about? Why are they using these terms? Is it an important term? Do I really need to learn it? Is it going to save me five minutes and five dollars? And that's when it reaches our litmus test. If it saves you five minutes and five dollars, then we feature it here on the show. So today's is very apropos. It's an oldie but a goodie. It's alphabet land, right? Don't you love it when we go to alphabet land? It's BCBA. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know what I thought I meant, this meant the first time I heard it, but I was like, what on earth? Uh, so let's take a look at our actual definition for what a BCBA is. But this is one you got to memorize, you guys, at least the BCBA, right? Because this is going to save your bacon time and time again. So a BCBA is a board certified behavior analyst. Doesn't sound like something that you grew up thinking, boy, I can't wait till I get a really good BCBA, does it? But trust me, you're going to want it now. So uh, let's take a look at what our actual, uh, what our working definition of a uh, BCBA is, a board certified behavior analyst. It's someone who's trained extensively in the application of the principles of ABA. And I know if you're new to this and you're like, well, I don't know what ABA is. ABA is Applied Behavior Analysis. And check out on our jargon playlist on our autism-live.com to hear more about that. But that is that amazing treatment that I was just talking about that my son got that made all the difference. So imagine, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of misunderstanding about ABA and what a BCBA does. So let me clear up a little bit of it. ABA happens to be the gold standard of treatment for autism right? But it is it was not invented for autism. And this is the thing that I need for people to understand first and foremost. This is an age-old science about behavior. And um, it's not just about autism behavior. And still at this point, after all this autism and now there's insurance for autism, it's still about 50-50 that BCBAs, about 50% of BCBAs work in the field of autism now, but 50% of them work elsewhere, not even in autism. They work in the business sector, creating um, behavior plans to get the most out of people who work at a corporation, right? They work with Olympic athletes. They work in nursing homes. They work in schools. So it's not just about autism, okay? And that's a really important thing for you to know because, um, Sometimes, you know, when you when you are fairly new to autism and you and you go finally when somebody goes, look, you you know, you're gonna need to do some ABA. So when you finally get that conversation, you go, oh, okay, oh, it's the thing. Okay, and it works. And it works whether your kiddo is very young or 92. And it works whether you yourself are 14 or you're 45. 
Um, it is a way of teaching that is very effective whether you're on the spectrum or not. And if you are very profoundly affected on the autism spectrum, it's gonna help you to learn and grow skills and help you to um, be rid of challenging behavior. And if you only have issues with social things, it's gonna help you to deal with those. So it's very, it's not, it's not one size fits all and it's not cookie cutter. It's very individual specific. So, um, you know, so you find out, oh, well, this is what we need, right? And you and you find out, oh, well, I need a BCBA because the BCBA is the architect. They're the person who designs the program that is very specific. Like first we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do that, and then we're gonna do this. Oh, this didn't work, so we're gonna go back and we're gonna do this. They are the architect, right? They're the artist that decides what colors we're gonna paint and in what order, and they're brilliant at it. They, you know, are trained and, and those who deal with in the field of autism, they get really, really brilliant at this. But when you go to look for a BCBA, you want to ask, are you someone who works in the field of autism? How long have you been working in the field of autism? Uh, right? Because some of them are not, they're not necessarily experts in autism. That's what I want to say. But some BCBAs absolutely are experts in autism. And I've got one of those coming up for you a little bit later on today. You're gonna love her. Uh, okay, so you want a BCBA on your case and usually schools at this point, they're supposed to have a BCBA. So um, I wanna encourage you if your kiddo is going to school to ask who's the BCBA at the school, who's the BCBA um, on the case. Sometimes like a district will have one BCBA and they'll share that BCBA among all the schools in the district. But it's a worthwhile question to ask. And if you're doing ABA at home um, or with a center, you for sure want to ask who is my BCBA? Who is the architect here? That's the person who's going to chart the course and they're, you know, they're your navigator and they're brilliant. Super, super cool. And they go through a lot of training. They're board certified. So there you go. And they abide by a certain um, code of ethics, and which is really wonderful. And there is an organization that oversees that license, licensure. That's a good word. And, um, and the ongoing education that they have to do, which is going to come into play a little bit later on in the show. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. So BCBA, it's a good word to know, even though it's in alphabet land. Okay, but first up, uh, I just adore her. We've got um, Dr. Amanda Kelly is joining us right now from Hawaii, and she is better known as the Behavior Babe. So Amanda, there she is. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Shannon. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. It's so glad to have you here. And we, we so adore you and it's thrilled to have you back on the show. Um, you are somebody, despite your, the way, you know, your young appearance here, you've been working in the field of special education and autism now. Is it true for 20 years? Is that true? Yes, it's, uh, it's true. I hate to give away my age. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, no, I, I would, uh, you know, it's a tough thing. You're an expert, but I, nobody would know. Um, so, and you've got a very important presentation that's coming up. I, our word of the day, we do jargon of the day, and our word today was BCBA, um, our, our, you know, our alphabet land thing. But um, one of the things I talked about was uh, that I said we would mention later on is continuing education. So, uh Tell us a little bit about what you're going to be talking about and why that feeds into that. Sure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And it's so nice to see your face. <laughs> my, and, and my bald head. Sorry about that. I'm not new things. I'm actually doing my hair because I have time. And I'm mm. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, the great, great topic that you're going to be talking about. And, and, uh, and I don't even tell them what it is and when it is. Sure. So it, this Friday, it's at um, 6 p.m. on the East Coast time, which is 3 p.m. for the Californians, and it's noon. So I'll try to make it reasonable for me here in Hawaii. But I'm really excited because it's the first continuing education event that I'm posting solely on my own. Usually I'm a guest, I'm invited, and I love collaborations. And so 
I decided, hey, let's make that a part of what I'm doing with the business, Doby. And um, so it's the first event. And this was actually supposed to be an invited keynote address at the California Association for Behavior Analysis Conference. And that was my first cancellation, um, or actually it was my second, but my first, the day of cancellation because of COVID. Yeah. Um, they gave us a chance to host continuing education, which is what we need to maintain our certification as behavior analysts and assistant behavior analysts. And um, they did a thing called Couchella. So they really, like, they had to give talks and it was supposed to be our original talks, but we were right in the beginning of COVID. And I thought nobody wants to hear about the history of an online avatar. Um, I was feeling a little bit down at the time and I thought, let's talk about something relevant. And so we did, we, we shifted into the telehealth and ethics topic. And then yes. now that we are all finding our groove a bit more, I thought now might be the time to story tell a little bit and people might want to kind of uh, escape for a little while down memory lane. And interestingly enough, I'm going to talk about the last 10 years now of Behavior Babe, but I also wanted to talk about the next uh, and not just for Behavior Babe because Really, her goal was to make sure people are still talking about behavior analysis, to make sure that we have children and adults accessing services. And I tried to do that the way I thought was fun. So anyone who's interested in hearing the story, the journey, and also I think taking some tips away for maybe how to become an effective advocate or disseminator at whatever level that you need to in your life, I hope you feel some tips as well. And so Behavior Babe, it's it's like you're, it's, I mean, I'm going to say alter ego, but it, you know, it's, it's you, um, but it's this, this character that you sort of created to be able to disseminate um, information to people and for people to be able to consume it. People like me, for instance, that were moms that were like up a tree and didn't know, you know, I didn't go to college for this. Um, I've lost your sound a little bit, Amanda. I don't know what happened. Can you oh, I just mouthed, I mouthed oh, right. Okay. okay. Um, so the top, the title of the topic is uh, a decade of de dissemination, a flashback and a fast forward. And so if, if, if there are people who are out there who are BCBAs, they can get continuing education units for this. Um, but parents can, and, you know, people off the street can tune in to watch this. Yes. Absolutely. So the goal is to make it above and beyond our task list. So more than what a BCBA needs to sit for the exam to become a BCBA, we always have to make sure we're stimulating our brains. But I try to do it in a way that's digestible and that other people can receive it. That's the whole goal of Behavior Babe. Um, so yeah, parents, teachers, often we have a lot of teachers um, as well as other family members. So some extended family, they usually kind of join me in certain talks and ask questions. Um, I love that. So yes, it's, the event is only $15. We try to make it also really reasonable. Um, we actually did a $10 for the first 50, but I think we might be over that right now. But yeah, we would love that piece of it because my journey and the journey of our field, it involves parents, it involves teachers, it involves behavior analysts. We are not operating on our own in a vacuum. <laughs> Absolutely. And so where they need to go to register? Okay, so if you're interested, you can um, just, the website is d-o-b-e dash com, and you just click on webinar. And it's right now the only webinar because it's our first. So that stands for Dobe Distinguished Organization of Behavior Enterprises, but it's d-o-b-e dash a-b-a dot com. And so since we're talking about Doby, tell us a little bit, because you were on the show before to talk about it, but if people weren't here, tell them what Doby is and what you're trying to do. So that's part of the evolution of what I've done as a practitioner. I started working in home with a child who was two years old in West Virginia back in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s. Then I went on and got you know my degrees. And then once I kept going, I thought, so much to know, so much to share people um and so i definitely want to want to make sure i'm doing all of that you know the the piece of it with with Adobe was how do we help other organizations so how can i share what i've learned last year in 2019 all 50 states now cover autism insurance or or aba ot speech services for individuals with autism that lends itself to a whole new host of 
challenges or opportunities for businesses and organizations. And we start to see the small mom and pops who definitely have their hearts in it, um, you know, fizzling out and not being able to compete with larger organizations sometimes. And I think we need both. I think we need all of that. We need to have a good, strong system. And so what we do with Adobe is we try to support typically smaller organizations, but larger as well with, you know, do you need help? Do you need billing credentialing? We don't do that but we partner with people who do. And our goal is to make it more affordable, to give them a louder voice. If they're a small company, they might only have you know, 10 members or 10 accounts with a company. But if we have 10 of those companies, we now have 100 accounts and can get people help quicker. So it's also that as well as some clinical guidance and support. We do site visits, not during COVID. So we've pivoted, which is what we always have to be doing um, Certainly, I would say autism parents, but behavior analysts too. Absolutely, we're every, every that is the word right now. Pivot, right? Uh, we want Tammy is saying hello, and Avani has said, written in and said everyone's journey is so important, and it's so true. Um, and I think you know, I remember the day that my son was diagnosed, and the developmental pediatrician. Um, who was not had no bedside manner whatsoever. The one positive thing that she said to me, uh, and I didn't, and it was hard to take it at the time. She said, "Be grateful that your son has been diagnosed today, because she had been working in the field for 50 years. In fact, it was her first day of retirement. She diagnosed him in her first day of retirement, and she said, "We've learned more about autism in the last five years than we have learned in the entire." 50 years of my practice before this. And, and, and that was almost 15 years ago. And, and I always think about that, about how much I know for sure, how much more we know than we knew on that day. Um, and how much things have changed in the last 10 years, uh, Dr. Kelly. And I, you know, I, I love watching that you're keeping pace with it. And so much changed with insurance and you're providing a really important service to make sure that ABA providers can keep up with those changes and, you know, stay staffed. And, and you know, it's, I, I think it's a very hard time for small ABA providers and a lot of them have gone out of business and that's a shame because we need, this is a, you know, we're on a crusade and we need as many people as possible to help as many people as possible. So I appreciate what you're doing. Um, and again, so I, we can go to D-O-B-E dot A, or excuse me, hyphen A-B-A dot com. Um, lots of information that we can get there, but also we can, it's webinar that, that, that we want to click on, correct? Yeah, and, and so, and go ahead. We are, we are recording the webinar. So if anybody can't meet that time, if you register, you do get access to it for an entire week after the, the recording. So I don't want anyone to fear if they're just not available. I know we're juggling our families and our work and our lives from home right now, most of us. And I got to say, you know, on my Facebook uh, post this morning, it came up um, eight years ago that I was at an ABAI conference. And I think it was the first time that I met you like eight years ago today. So that's very interesting anniversary. Um, but I went to uh, ABAI, it was in Seattle. And I was a mom with a one uh, person camera crew and we went around and we're interviewing people. And I saw all these topics that were, be, were being discussed. And I went, why are there, there not more parents here? And, and I've been on a crusade ever since then because as parents, we don't feel like we're invited to these things. And that's part of why I wanted you to be on to talk about this, Amanda, because you know, I know that the, the main goal here is that you're providing that continuing education piece for the BCBAs, which is really important, but I want to empower parents. Like there's a whole lot going on in the field of ABA and you're not shut out of it. If you, if you go into these places, like you welcome the parents, I know that you do and other places do too. You can go and learn as much as you want to. Um, and don't feel like you can't go to them unless you already have credentials. You just don't get the continuing education credit. Right. That's really the only difference. Yeah. And, and I, I do want to say, you know, the website, thank you, uh, behaviorbabe.com too is my other landing space. And there's an entire section that's called Caregiver's Corner. And it's got 
15, 20 drop down pages. And I even say on the home page, don't be limited by the titles or the headings. It's just to orient you because there's a lot of information. So teachers, please go read the parents or caregivers section. Caregivers, please jump over to the teachers or the students section. So I try to make as much information as freely available and as digestible. I mean, it is hard to sift through a ton of information and to know what to believe, help it synthesize. So I always provide the links and the references. Don't take my word for it. I'm only one expert, <laughs> but- But yeah. you are an expert and it's a wonderful thing to be able to be on your site and, and learn from you and, and in such a fun way. You're a fun person. And I, you know, I love the whole behavior babe um, thing. So this is going to be wonderful on Friday, uh, a decade of dissemination, a flashback and a fast forward. Uh, and again, go to Dobe, D-O-B-E hyphen ABA.com, click on webinar. While I've got you, Dr. Kelly, I just, you know, and you touched on this briefly, but I'm asking everybody like, you know, how are you personally doing during um, this whole pandemic? Thank you so much for asking. That's uh, it's a hard one to answer. I think, you know, financially I'm doing okay, which is great. That takes mm -hmm. a bit of anxiety and stress um, out of the picture. I am not doing my trips or travels, um, which was my anticipated 2020. So that was some um, reshifting and telling myself it's okay to feel sad about those things. Although there is a bigger issue at play here. Uh, my family is healthy. I live alone. So it's been very strange to have this much time at my house. I am usually out and about. I am usually off island uh, about half of, the, half of the month, every every month. And so um, I have an exercise bike and a projector screen and I've been watching old movies and trying to do it out on the porch when it's nice out. So I'm making it and um, I'm learning to cook. And I don't know if people know this, but it tastes so delicious. So it's... <laughs> Now, are you, uh, I, I'm always interested how people are able, are you able to get groceries delivered? Do you have to go far? Because you, uh, are you in a populated place? You're a little bit out in no man's land, aren't you? I'm, I'm in one of the more remote places on the island of Oahu, although it is the most populated island. My grocery store is only a couple miles up the road. It's the most expensive one. It's not where you want to buy most things. I'm very grateful. I actually have a friend who's, um, her husband runs a food truck and they need to go buy in bulk. And so she was out and about. And when I came back from, from California, I self-quarantined um, because of the time uh, when I was there to what was going on here. And so I was really grateful that community came by. We don't really have delivery in these parts of, of anything actually pre-COVID. And now we have a few restaurants that have figured out how to do that. So that's actually been a new luxury um, during this time. I, and I don't know if they'll keep doing it, but we're staying fed. And I did get a care package. So this is just somebody who I met once in person, uh, but through Behavior Babe and they sent me toilet paper and they sent me like a face mask. And that was Leslie. Leslie, thank you so much. It was, it was like, you know, it's nice to be known and to be called an expert, but it's really nice to get care packages of toilet paper. So. Wow. I mean, that's impressive because people are, you know, people are hoarding their toilet paper. So good for you. Plus, which too, I, you know, there've been a couple of times that I've wanted to mail something to somebody and I'm like, oh, that's a whole thing. Like you got to go. And, and so there's been no mailing um, for anything. Uh, but I just find it fascinating because, you know, I think most people would think, oh, well, you're quarantined in Hawaii. Like you're in paradise. This must be, but it's, you know, there are different things, different places and different challenges. But I'm, I'm glad that you're making it work and that, it, that it's happening okay. And uh, I'm hoping that before too long, we're all going to be safely able to move about the cabin. <laughs> but uh, uh, but thrilled that we had this opportunity. And I'm glad that you're figuring it out and that you're starting to do these webinars because I have a feeling you're going to be doing a lot more of these. So uh, the, the webinar, this first one is on Friday, but as you said, if somebody registers for it, they can get the recording and watch it anytime they want in the next week. So you guys, it's D-O-B-E hyphen or dash, whichever you prefer, ABA.com. Um, and then you will have an opportunity and it'll be live on Friday. Yes. 
it'll be live. So I'm taking questions as well. And if people cannot attend live, but want those questions answered or um, addressed live, they can, they can email or they can send it in when they register for the event. Okay, so on Friday, it's at 6 p.m. Eastern time, which is 3 p.m. Pacific time, which is noon Hawaii time. I absolutely love it and we adore you. Dr. Kelly, thank you so much for all that you're doing and for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Shannon, aloha. <laughs> aloha, take care, bye-bye. Uh, that is the behavior, babe, Dr. Amanda Kelly. Uh, okay, uh, and I promised you guys that on Tuesdays that we were going to do something really fun because you know me, I love some games, I love some activities, I love some art projects, I love some STEM activities. And so every Tuesday, we're featuring a different uh, company that makes things that may or may not be perfect for you during this period of time where we're still spending more time at home. I, you know, I gotta say, I, this morning was a real interesting thing for me because I was reading about um, people whose kids are going back to school today. And I was like, it's that same sort of disconnect that I have when it's 90 degrees here and you guys are talking about snow and I'm like, what? That's happening where? What? What are you talking about? I can't imagine because we are still in lockdown here in Los Angeles. And But everywhere people need activities. And so many of you have written in, written in and said, I want educational activities. And what about my kids that are twice exceptional? They need STEM activities. And we put a bunch of them on Pinterest for you. And you guys said, oh, I need a part-time job collecting all the things that I would need to do for this. So I've got your answer for you today. Uh, we're going to be, uh, and I think she's already with us. Uh, Risa Schwartzman is joining us from Grizzly Games. And I'm turning because I'm going to start to pull some of these things down. Because what they've done is make all those activities super easy for you. Uh, you don't have to go to 17 stores, order off of Amazon, 13 things, uh, right? You just need uh, to order from Grizzly Games. Uh, and um, then you, uh, Gridley Games, excuse me. Um, and then you uh, you just have to add the one ingredient, whatever it is. There's Risa. Hi, Risa hi. Schwartzman, how are you? Great. Hi. How are you guys? Uh, <laughs> we're doing well. I just was kind of waxing poetic about what you guys have done because we've got a lot of folks that watch the show that need activities to do with their kiddos. And we like for them to be educational, but you know, we have a whole Pinterest page, Risa, where I put activities um, that are STEM activities and parents have written in and said, oh, Shannon, it's just exhausting to gather the materials, uh, right? Right, um, that's the whole premise. You know, I'm a mom and actually now a grandma. Um, and no, stop, you look too young for that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I, like you, you know, you wanna be able to open something and get busy and get going and not disappoint your kids. And we let you know what you need right away, but we really try to provide everything you need to kind of really get going and get the kids involved in exploration and, and touch and feel and, you know, I, I grew up with a learning disability, so I'm very aware of um, there's different kinds of learning. And I really believe in the best form of, of learning, um, being that I was a dance teacher for 19 years, is, is exper experiential. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to bring here, is this experiential learning. And the best way to learn is to have fun. So if that's you're having fun, and oh, by the way, you're learning, oh, sorry. <laughs> So that's what we're trying to do. Exactly. So just add milk. Um, yeah. We've got them in the store. They actually come in this really cute little milk. I cake. love it. Um, <laughs> and that's where we started uh, with our kids. We first started with games. Uh, we start. We kind of got into this business, not on purpose, but one morning I woke up with this idea that I wanted to um, do this one experiment in particular where you have the magic dancing. Or I love it. Dance. I, I love, love that it. one. I really moment and it doesn't matter what age you are it's an aha moment and so we wanted to, the whole experience we wanted the kit right from the time you hold it to be a part of the experience um, and so what we did is we wanted to have there's you know there's a whole pressure now on stem which i'm assuming your your, your watchers know is uh, science technology engineering and math but yeah. being that I'm a dancer background, I always like I like to bring both the art of science and um, 
And I like our products to be co-ed, non-gender. And so I think this really does a great job doing that. You've got all images. You can make the scientists an artist, the artist a scientist, and get them all together. Uh, with Just Add Milk, all of the, or I should say all of our kits have multiple science and art activities. Um, yes. And uh, I'm, un I'm unpackaging and, and showing everybody, you know, so a lot, you know, I've gone to do the milk thing before, and I'll, and most of us have milk somewhere in the house. Um, it doesn't matter though, what kind of milk you use either. You can use yeah. um, you can use uh, homogenized, but you can use buttermilk. You can use soya milk. It just needs to have some fat in it, and that's what does it for that project. But really, we make milk dancing. We make milk solids. You make um, milk pads. Uh, I mean, mouse pads. Yeah. You can do psychedelic paper and a whole variety of activities in that one. And that was our first kit. And then we and, and we've got, because we've got everything here to do a bunch of different experiments. And then we get the booklet. And the thing that I love about the booklet is, is that, you know, first it will tell you, you know, like all the experiments and right. it tells you what you need from the kit and what you would need um, from your house. And sometimes it's just like a little thing that you would need from the house, but it's stuff that you have around, I guarantee it. Yeah. Um, so, it, it ha but then it tells you, how it works. It gives you like the scientific experiment. Um, and then there's a place um, where it talks about reflections and observations. So for, I've heard this from so many parents uh, that they're, they're like, you know, I'm not a teacher. I didn't go to school for education. And so it tells you exactly like what questions to ask your kiddo about like, why you know, why do you think that what happened? It says, what happened to the food coloring when you first put it on the milk? And then what about the glue? What happened when you added a drop of soap to the milk? So you don't have to think. For those of you who have said to me, Shannon, don't make me think. Like, I want to do these things. I want it to be educated, but don't make me think. The next thing is you can learn with your kid. Yes. Yeah. And and I love it. And some of the kits um, in, in, in the book, it has a place um, where you can write down your observations. So the yeah. kids can be, Yeah. And, um, and they're I leave them with something they can take back also. Like, so here's some of the paper that I made the last time we were doing this experiment and we made a mouse pad. And so, you know, we taught them how to make mouse pads. And so it's useful art. You can make, I've, I've used so many of these to make thank you cards. So yes. we really encourage re recycle, reuse, re repackage. Um, and, and then we have six other kits. So the, one of the next ones we did was, oh, you get my mind. Vulcan mind meld. Uh, yeah, mine's in, in reverse. But yeah. Just even from the package, we put it in a can because we want the kids to be able to put their experiments in here um, or reuse it for some other use. Uh, yep. One of the main experiments in there, also, it's you know, it's a study of polymers. Or, so it's not about just making slime. You can make slime. There's a lot of recipes out there. And, and we also give them these really really good little uh, kit, um, plastic containers that you can keep your your experiments in for a long time. And you can make a bouncing ball. I can bounce it. I don't know if you could see it here, but bouncing balls and you can make slime. So it's a study of viscosity. You can see here, it's like slimy. And then and you kids, can it's very tactile. Our kids love these. At, so you know. learning how to do different kinds of tactile too, that just by changing an experiment, I can have a different whole, yes. different whole experience. Um, yeah. And then, you know, teaching them how to may have a little patience with the same kit, you can make different kinds of crystals um, and, uh, and they can watch them something we create over time. So even though it's just a little kit, there's still lots of things to do when they just add glue. Uh, and then we have just add sugar. Look at oh. how good we are. <laughs> Vulcan mind mouth. Wow. Uh, we are connected. love this. And I, I love all the packages. I love that the, like this one, you know, cause these are reusable. I love that there's a pull string. Um, so this is like really, I, you know, if they watch the show, you know, I'm all about is, does the packaging work? Does it last? Um, and does it make it extra fun? And you guys have really hit it out of the park on that. It's like, check Thank that you. box. So yeah. for an example with just add glue, uh, sorry, just add sugar, we really want the kids to reuse their package. So first of all, it can be a little purse, but we give them a decoupage recipe and they, we, you know, you can decoupage your box and now you have a candy box. You can put all your treats in your box. It doesn't open. I'm just, 
you know, you can I, I totally would have kept my Barbie shoes in this when I was a kid. That's totally there what I would have done. Right. And uh -huh. we also have it in multiple languages because not everybody speaks English at home as the first language. So all of the kids are also in Spanish. Love, love, love. Um, and came, of course, just that egg, which I think I see you holding up now, too. Yes. <laughs> and it's not just an Easter holiday experience, but of course it makes it extra special if it's around Easter. Um, and, and this this totally would have been a Barbie house after we, we were done with it. But I love all the things that you can do with an egg. The one that I am the most excited about to do is uh, one where you first you blow out the egg and then you make a, a geode out of your egg. Stop. It's just so cool. So here's like uh, some of the geodes so we can make um, and you can make, uh, we give you a dinosaur so you can, and soap, so they can make their own soap in the egg with the dinosaur so just pouring egg. We can make candles, we give you wax to make candles. I personally am a mosaic kind of girl. You collect, you teach the kids, they don't have to throw everything away. They get a little canvas to make their art. Um, we, this is our wise aleck, this is our logo. So th this is all wow. mosaic, which now makes the container that much more savable. And love, then, love, love. You just said, was our next one. The part that I love about this, again, we're trying to be reusable, recyclable. You actually cook right here in the box. This is a solar oven. Exactly. You cook right in the box. Now, uh, I, I, I just love these. I just think they're so smart. And I think it's a great gift for any of you that have to, I mean, we've been having this thing where everybody's having virtual birthday parties right now. And, you know, you need to send a present. And you want to send over something that's good during this period of time where we're staying at home as much as possible. You know me, I always love it if it's if it's fun and the kids get excited about it. And if there's an educational component to it, these are the best birthday gifts you can send over. The parents will love you. The kid will love you. Um, and it's something that they can, you know, each one has like 10 different experiments. It's not like one and done. Um, so, you know, crazy, crazy good, the things that you can do. What are you holding up there? So just add sun, other than, you know, you can make your nachos or cook a hot dog. Uh, you can make, you get a canvas, you can make a painting, you can make your own crayons. We teach them how to make their own stained glass windows. Uh, they, they learn all that. These are some of the art projects. You, they make your own sundial. There's a whole variety of other activities that we do. It's packed with stuff, you guys. And it's, it's all, you know, like there, I guarantee you that there is something, they have age ratings on them, right? But there's yeah. something in them that every parent's going to be able to find to be able to do with every kid. It is something where the parents, it is, it's not that thing where you give it to the kids and go let them do it on their own. It's a, it's, it's an activity to do together. And I think that that's a blessing because we need things to be interacting with our kids on the spectrum. Now tell me about Just Add Baking Soda. These are oh, and just add fruits and vegetables. Oh my goodness. Totally hot off the press. Um, so fruits and veggies, tons of things you can do in here. Make your own potato um, battery, make a clock, fruit stamping. Uh, again, tons of stuff that you can do in here. Um, just add baking soda, do a volcano, make your own bath bombs, make your own uh, ornaments for the holidays and a whole variety of other activities. So these all have like, I think this one has 20 activities and this one has like 12 or something. So there's lots of things to do in each of the packages. And then we also have all of our wonderful games uh, that are all really family oriented as well. Okay, so I just love these things, but I'm gonna make a suggestion. Uh, because I think that they're super, really wonderful. And the only thing that I would have loved more it, and I, cause I, I, as, as we opened up kits and we were like playing around with things, we were like, oh, we kind of want to watch the instructional video. And we went online and we saw some reviews that showed you a little bit of things, but I, so I think it would be great if you even if it was your viewers, um, and, and, uh, or our viewers and the people who play your games is that while you're doing something, make an instructional video. We have so many parents who have um, kiddos that are teenagers that they want to be YouTubers. 
And a lot of what YouTubers do is make instructional videos, you guys. I, what I would love as a companion piece to all of these is if there was a video showing a kid doing each one of the experiments. And maybe that's a challenge you put out to your, your users, but that's the only other thing. And, and I sort of feel like our audience could do that for you. That'd but great. We, I that's the right? next thing on that challenge. There you go. So get get the kits, you guys. And where do we need to go to get them? So Amazon for sure. Hopefully your local toy stores. If they don't, you can contact us, us directly at Gridley Games. Um, and we can, if you can't find them, we'll make sure you get them. There you go. So gridleygames.com and it's yeah. Gridley, no E, yeah. uh, G-R-I-D-D-L-Y. Um, but super timely and important because Again, you know, parents have just been crying for this kind of stuff and saying, you know, you know, we want to be able to do it. And I put them onto Pinterest and they're like, oh, I just don't have the time to go shop for and put together and set it all up. This is perfect because then you don't have to do that work. So thank you to Gridley Games thank for you. making that possible for us. I'm, I'm, I'm not holding up. I'm touching, but I'm not holding up. Um, you know, if your kids, I love this experiment. We've already started this. It's on my kitchen counter and I didn't bring it in. Uh, but making the rock. Candy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, absolutely love it. Super duper smart. Check out their whole catalog because you guys have other games. You have games have and their educational games. games. Yeah. Show us that one. Yeah. This is uh, wise Alec. This was our original game. Um, this is a family trivia game based on over a thousand questions in school curriculum and history, science, and spelling. And all ages can play it at the same time. It's, you can customize it to, to your family needs. Love, love, have, love. We have uh, strategy games. We have abstract strategy. We've got math games. We've got word games. We can. We have a game where you make your own game kit uh, called Rockets, uh, Rainbows, and Storms. So we've got tons of stuff. Check out our website. Yeah. Uh, Thegames.com. And if you need more information, contact us. We'd be happy to help you. There you go. So check it out, you guys. Gridley Games, G-R-I-D-D-L-Y games.com. Thank you so much for being with us and for having these yeah. wonderful activities for our kiddos uh, because we got to keep stimulating their minds, you guys. And we and for our kids on the spectrum, we need a way to connect. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'll tell you, like, if you've never done the milk thing, the dancing milk thing, uh, you know, start, I, I would just tell you, start with that one because you will be so jazzed and your kid will be so jazzed and they will want to come back, back and do more stuff. Make sure that you are reading to them from the booklet about what's happening and asking the questions, no matter if your child is verbal or not, because they, we all know that they're getting more than sometimes that they will tell us. But I'll tell you, I have done the milk thing in a classroom full of, of kids that, you know, are, were like, you know, I don't care. I'm not interested in whatever you're doing. And you start to put the, the, the food coloring into the milk and they all come over and go, why is it doing that? And then when you have the thing to be able to read to them why it's doing that, and then you add the next element and they go, what's that about? And they all want to get in and play all of them, all of them, all of them. So, um, you know, activate your kids' brains. Uh, GridleyGames.com. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having us and let us know how we can help. Yay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> right. Bye. 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 Take care. Uh, and so that was Risa Schwartzman from Gridley Games. Absolutely love these, you guys. Um, check them out. Uh, okay. So we've got like two minutes here before the end of the show. I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, and I want to say hi to Martha and I want to say hello to Dubai. We had a viewer from Dubai and Brenda who says, I love Behavior Babe, just a good follow. Absolutely. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what's happening on the show this week. And so tomorrow we are going to have Evelyn Kung, who's the clinical director for CARD instead of Dr. Grand Pichet. But you know, you guys love Evelyn Kung. She's going to be here and she's going to be answering your questions in real time. Um, and then on Friday, we have licensed marriage and family therapist, um, Vince Redmond, who's going to be with us taking your questions. And of course, I'm drawing a complete and total blank. Who's on Thursday? It's somebody fabulous that I love and I can't think who it is. Oh, they're going to hate that I don't know, that I don't remember. That's terrible. Uh, Traven, do you know? I can't remember. 
Uh, it's I have some timer, some timers, and I know it's somebody that I'm really excited about. Oh, for heaven's sake, I know who it is because they're not usually on Thursday. Bonnie Yates, because we didn't have yesterday um, because it was uh, Memorial Day. We're having Bonnie Yates on on Thursday, and she's going to answer questions that you guys have that are of a special education legal ilk, right? So Bonnie will be with us on Thursday. It's a really good week. We hope that you guys will tune in and be here with us. And don't forget, you don't have to wait till the show is live to ask a question. You can write to me at S, S as in snake, as in silly, as uh, uh, whatever word, Shannon, as in S, uh, dot Penrod, P as in Peter, E as in egg, N as in Nancy, R as in robot, O as in Oscar, D as in dog, uh, hyphen, uh, so s.penrod at autism-live.com. And that's live, L-I-V as in Victor E. I'm spelling for those of you who are listening on Deezer and iHeartRadio. Um, so thrilled uh, that you guys are here. Write in your questions to us and uh, we're happy to get those to whoever we need to get them to. Even if it is Temple Grandin, I do keep a list of questions for Temple so that anytime I'm talking to her, uh, I'm able to have those at the ready. So feel free, free to write those in. We are out of time this morning, but I thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Don't forget to subscribe. We love it when you subscribe to us or review us on iTunes. Thanks. Bye-bye. The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning. Uh, I had everything off. Uh, good morning and welcome to Autism Live. There's Evelyn Kung. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're coming to you live from my uh, back room and from a, a place uh, where Evelyn is and from a place where our producer Traven is. So excited to be here with you this morning. That's the first time that I ever just totally forgot to unmute myself and the show had already started. So apologies all the way around. Uh, now, today is Wednesday. And on Wednesdays, whenever possible, we have Dr. Doreen Grampiche here to answer your questions. But sometimes we can't. And when that happens, we are very fortunate on some occasions that we have Evelyn Kung to answer your questions. And today is one of those red letter days. We always enjoy it when she's here. Evelyn is, besides being a wonderful person and someone who just delights in our children, she is truly an expert in the field of autism. And she has been the clinical director at CARD for many, many, many years. But she uh, I, I, I should let you talk a little bit about this, Evelyn, but she has a wide breadth of experience. She's been doing this for how many years? Oh, almost 30. 
almost 30 years and has seen pretty much everything that there is to see from very small babies uh, up through people who are considered senior citizens. And she just has a way about her. And if you have a question, boy, she's one of the people that I run to and go, What's, what about this? So I'm thrilled that she's here to answer you guys' questions. Now I do have to give you the disclaimer that um, there is no expert in this field or any related field who could give individual specific advice in this particular format because they've never laid, laid eyes on the person. They don't have an opportunity to watch and see what's happening. So the, um, the things that she's gonna be talking about, um, she's, she's gonna give you, you guys ask a question, please ask as specifically as possible what it is that you're, you're looking for because everything is a clue and a hint, right? Um, and then she will give you information of a, a general nature, which should help you to ask more questions when you go to the experts who have eyes on the situation. So that's sort of the deal with this. And I want to point out, too, that there are lots of different ways that you can have your question um, be answered and be read on the show. So let's go over some of them. I know over the weekend, we had a Temple Grandin marathon, and um, I love it. So many people tuned out and enjoyed Temple Grandin. And a lot of you wrote in questions and we thanked some of them that are just specifically um, for Dr. Grannon the next time we have her on the show, which hopefully will be soon. Um, and some of them were that are something that would require um, someone like a BCBA, like uh, Evelyn to answer. We, you know, we've got some of those in today, but I also want to address that some of you were frustrated because you weren't getting your answer, your questions answered in real time. That was all recorded. We didn't have Temple Grandin. It was just a series. And I think you figured that out as you stayed watching because uh, we changed locations. Those were pre-recorded interviews. So, um, but there are ways that you can have your question be answered. And we do hang on to all the questions you guys send, even if we don't get to all of them. But I, I encourage you to be persistent. So Trayvon's going to show you some of the different ways that you can connect to us. I want to tell you about our homepage, which is autism-live.com. Lots of things to do there. Now we have a chat button that's at the bottom of that page. Unfortunately, this morning that is not working. So I want to encourage you don't go there today, but usually that's a really great way to get your question answered because it's very immediate. And I have it here on an iPad right next to me woo um, where I can see it and it's in my face, but it's not working this morning. So don't push that button today. Um, I would encourage you today to be writing in on YouTube and Facebook where we are live. Uh, we are also on Periscope and Twitter, but I think the better place to get the questions answered is on Facebook and YouTube. And um, we podcast to YouTube, iTunes, uh, Deezer, iHeartRadio, um, what else am I forgetting? Spotify, all of those places. But don't forget our homepage is autism-live.com. Uh, but I hope that you will ask your question in whatever way you can. Don't forget, you can also write directly to me, s.penrod at autism-live.com. I know when you watch the show, you can see that there are so many questions coming from so many different ways, and we don't ever get to all of them anymore, and that's a bummer. Uh, you know, it used to be that we could, but we just don't ever get to all of them anymore. But I do bank them and try to squeeze them in at another time. But it really helps. If you have a question, be persistent um, and, and write in. And I notice, I really do notice, I go, oh, this person has asked this question twice. They get moved to the top of the list, right? So I encourage you, be, be, be persistent. So Evelyn, we're so thrilled that you're here with us this morning. We so enjoy you and, and having the time to spend with you. You doing okay during this Isolation, the gray yep. isolation. We're all good. <laughs> good. I'm glad. Uh, so I'm going to jump in here with a question that's been asked in a lot of different ways, but this particular parent said the school year is over and we are being told there will be no ESY, which is extended school year. What would you recommend to do, we do to help our kids over the summer? This is the, this is the question of the right? a month. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Everyone is asking this and what I would say right now is take advantage of the time that you have with, no, with an open schedule and just do as much therapy as you can because ABA works in t when it's intensive and it works even better and the kids learn more quickly with the more repetition they have. So if you can get your ABA provider to get you as many hours as you can, this is the time to do it. I know that a lot of people feel like they need that school setting, they need 
um, their kids to be social, um, you know, with other kids. But the, the thing is, there is so much information. You can't really be social unless you have a communication system. Yeah, I think she froze a little bit, but she was saying you can't be social. And pretty much most of our form of communication issue. So this take advantage of this time and work on language. Because if your child can actually speak what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're doing, they're going to be so social when you get back to the point of being interactive again. You know, right now, when so many of the behaviors that we see in our kids with frustration and tantrums and noncompliance, a lot of it has to do with that they don't have the words to speak. They don't have the words to communicate. I don't want to do that right now. Let me do that later. And, and a, typical, a neurotypical kid is sitting there questioning everything. They don't need to tantrum. They don't need to scream. They don't need to engage in any of those problem behaviors to get their point across. And our kids usually aren't really good about communicating what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're wanting. So take advantage of the summer and get some therapy and just work on communication. And once that communication is fluid, not that they know how to do it, but that they do it easily. That's the yeah. key. They have to do it easily without thinking because once they hit that social setting, there's a thousand other types of stimuli coming at them. So the language has to be at the very top and the easiest to grab and use. If it's still something they have to think about and they have to find it, all of those things in the social setting are actually a distraction and it's harder to find those words. So use your summer, get some of the information in there, get the language in there, get the fluency built up so that they don't have to think about talking. And then you're so, when they go back to that social setting, they're just going to be great. I love it. I love it. I, I've been saying for weeks here, Evelyn, you know, when you, when there's a bunch of things you can't do in a given time, try to do all the things that you can only do then. You know, I learned that having a baby because everybody would say to me, you know, when the baby is napping, you nap. I didn't, I didn't really cotton to that, but I, but there were certain things that I realized there are some things that I cannot do when I'm with him. So when, when I'm not with him, I need to make sure that I do all of those things, right? Yep. And it's the same way now. You know, there are certain things that we cannot do with our kiddos. It's just they're not on the table. Um, but, you know, there are certain things that we can only do now that we will never have this opportunity again. And that is true with ABA therapy all the time. You have funding for a set period of time. And as your child ages, you get less funding for it. So now is the best moment to do all the therapy that you can because this moment will never come again. And it doesn't matter whether your child is three or eight. They are not going to get this moment again. So do all the therapy you can. It's not, it's not coming back around. Yeah. And all the funding sources understand that this is an unusual time. So this is actually being more open about when people are making requests for more hours. Yeah. Yeah. Take advantage, y'all. Get on this train. And, they are and I'm, actually I'm, well, I'm sorry. I think you stuck for a second. Go ahead. Say what you were saying. Oh, no. I was just saying that all the funding sources right now understand this need. So if you don't have enough hours, go and ask for more. They might give it to you right now because they're the most open I've seen them. Yes, I, I absolutely. We're loving the funding sources right now. Hey, I'm saying hi to Bonnie and I'm saying hi to Nina, who have written in and said good morning and hi. Uh, next question, very, very appropriate for this. Uh, parent writes in and says, my 15-year-old hyperventilates when, whenever we put a mask on him. I'm worried this will become regular panic attacks. Should we keep trying or wait? You know, right now, because of the pandemic, it's a need. You have to put a mask on him. But it doesn't have to turn into a panic attack, okay? It really doesn't. It's like with everything else that we do. As long as he has exposure and he has time to acclimate, it becomes easier. Mm -hmm. so just take that time, work with your BCBA, and really work on practicing wearing that mask. Wear it one minute, two minutes, three minutes, and have reinforcers for when he's wearing it. Let him play games on, you know, whatever device he loves <laughs> or book or game, like whatever it is during only when he's wearing the mask and he can't access that game or toy any other time. If you start doing this, he'll start adjusting to that mask. 
And then one of the things that, you know, I've learned because when I wear the mask, I, I always recognize when it's uncomfortable. So like I've been trying to walk every night and some nights I hit my mask, it's perfectly and it doesn't bother me. And there's other nights where there's just something about it. And so mm -hmm. allow him to adjust. If he's out wearing it and he's been wearing it for a good amount of time and he wants to take it out, find a safe place, have him pull it down, give him, you know, some time with it and then put it back on and then go your merry way. You know, just, he needs the time to adjust. For 15 years, he hasn't had to wear it. Yeah. But he, and he doesn't understand the, the background of the need. You know, for us, we, it's hard for us to wear, but we understand the need and then it's easier. And for him, he doesn't understand that. So he's basically, you have to give that extra reinforcer for him because he doesn't have the understanding of why now suddenly every time he goes out, he has to wear it, you know, and you're basically providing the reason as maybe it's like, hey, this is a time that you get access to something and that's okay for now. You know, in the future, you might want to explain it more if he's able to understand. But for now, you need him to wear it now to be safe and you want your family to be safe. I, I appreciate how much credit you give because, you know, there are a lot of people, adults, that are typically developing uh, who are or who don't understand why they have to wear masks and feel that they should be excluded. Um, so I, I, I love that you're giving everybody the benefit of the doubt. But the truth of the matter is it's uncomfortable. It's not what we're used to. It's a change. It's different. And, it, you know, random you know, people walking around who don't have sensory issues are having a hard time with it. But I like to look at our first responders and, you know, what they say and what, you know, when they started to wear a mask, they went through a transition period where it felt funny. And now they all say across the board, I, so I forget that I have it on. Um, and we've seen that, um, you know, like those pictures that they have of the scars that people are getting from, you know, because they're wearing them so tight. Um, and, and, you know, it takes a while getting used to. I wear a CPAP at night. So I have this like mask on my face and it has taken me two years to get used to it. And now, you know, I'm, I'm very, very, but if you had asked me two years ago, I would have told you there's no way that there's going to come a time when this is going to feel like a normal thing. Right. So I think that, you know, patience and rewards and, and you have said before with us to another parent about, you know, having them be a part of picking which mask. There's a, there's a good friend of mine who's on the spectrum, um, Alex Plank, who's the creator of wrongplanet.net, which I encourage you, if, if you have teenagers, check that site out. But Alex has not been able to have one of the, you know, the, the little masks or one of the things that hooks over his ears. It's just not comfortable for him. So a friend who knows about these things got him one of the like intense gas masks that has the C or uh, excuse me, the N94 replaceable canisters on the side, and it goes just underneath his glasses. It's rubber. It's meant for hunters. It's like this serious business thing. He loves it. it like it's his favorite thing to wear, and he wears it out, you know, and it attracts a great deal of attention because people go, dude, you know, that's hardcore. Um, but he kind of likes the attention. It's a color that he likes. Um, and he says, you know, the seal of it is just so much more comfortable and it, and it's meant to be very breathable for people who are exercising and hunting. So he's just infinitely happier. And, and it cost him like $15. Now that was back before things were crazy. I'm sure that it's $105 now, but if that were the thing that your kid said that I would wear and that they would feel more comfortable, I think we would all agree that a little bit more money, if you have it, is uh, worth it for safety today. And, and just don't, and remember the sensory aspect. So many of our kids have that sensory aspect. So if there is something that your child likes to put near their face, make that be the hint. <laughs> there you go. There <laughs> and, you go. And make a mask out of that fabric or that, you know, that texture. And you probably will love it, you know, but you're using it as a clue to what he likes near his face. There you go. Hey, you saying good afternoon to Mia. Mia, we're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, okay, uh, oh, this, we've had this question in a bunch of different formats, but my 11 year old is way too happy with the shutdown. While this has been, uh, while this has been a blessing, uh, I guess because they haven't you know, uh, had a problem with it, they say I'm, way, uh, I'm worried about how to get him back outside when it's time, should I be working on this now and how? And let me just say, I'm right there with this 11 year old. 
I, I run a little agoraphobic and I have said to everyone at work, I'm fine with this, but good luck getting me back out of my house later on. Uh, you're going to have to line up the therapist to get me back out. Um, and some of our kids are just happier. They're like, woohoo. Um, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to be social. I don't have to go out. I don't have to be drug around by mom to do errands. I don't have to go to things that I don't want to do. I'm happy to stay home. What do we do? You know, this has actually been my concern for, there's so many families who were receiving a lot of ABA services prior to COVID. And there's, you know, understandably they've chosen not to have therapy and We've actually had a surge of family, kids who are doing really well in therapy where the parents are telling me, um, maybe we don't need therapy anymore because he's doing so well at home. And I had to come back around and say, look, this quarantine is actually reinforcing a lot of the rigidity that is ASD. So because he's happier being with his family, does it mean that going out is gonna be an easy task? And we've seen it across kids now where even like the type of food they're eating, they're narrowing, they're just going down that rigidity path of really closing in on all levels of what they're doing. So what we've been tell talking to families about is, you know, you have to know your area and what you're comfortable with in terms of safety and taking him out. Okay. You really have to understand that. We just talked about masks. Is he willing to wear a mask? He needs to be willing to wear a mask. And Earlier in COVID, when people couldn't find masks, I remember seeing like an adult wearing a Buzz Lightyear helmet. <laughs> mm -hmm. If they, they're not wearing masks and they're fine wearing a helmet, let them do it. But, you know, if you're okay going out, this would be the time to take them out. And you, would, you can just start slowly. Don't like go and start doing everything, you know, 10 things in a row on errands. But take him for one thing, make it short, make it a little bit longer next time. Maybe take him to see someone that he really loves. I love seeing um, some of our families have actually videotaped the kids going and seeing grandma and grandpa, like different people, and how yeah. happy the kids are like to finally be able to see people that they love seeing or going to their houses and things. So use your, you know, use what you're safe with or what you're okay with and then start there and slowly start taking them out. Make sure you're going to want to look at your routine at home. Routines really help our kids, but we've been here a long time. So some of those routines you need to start adjusting every day because some of our kids are too into the routine that is there. So, you know, you can make a, if you have an activity schedule that you're working on, you can make it more general. So not labeling it like from 10 to 11, we're, you know, we're doing this activity. It can be. Oh, and she froze right at the We're doing part. an activity and we'll find out what that, but just change uh. it, around, move it, just really work on anything that is the exact same, you need to start changing it around. Even the food. We've a lot of our kids, cause it's just easy to just cook what they like and not have to deal with the fuss. You need to start in put, making food that is a little bit different, you know, on their plate every day so that there's, they can keep the range of um, eating that they used to have, you know, so they're not narrowing on their own. If you're okay with creating a pod now where, you know, there's a family you trust or family members you're okay coming in and out with, maybe that's the time to do it. But just do what you feel safe and, you know, and use telehealth, use, use Zoom because make him talk to those people outside you know through the room and through through the computer and you know make him inter, you know interact and have conversations daily with people that he's not used to seeing you know on a day-to-day -day basis since you've been in quarantine there's a lot of things that you can do through zoom and through telehealth and through teletherapy so if you don't have advantage if you're not taking advantage of that now do teletherapy because you know, those therapists that he used to love or those people that he used to love, it's going to, you know, that generalization aspect that doesn't come naturally to kids on the spectrum. You're, you know, using the computer is one way to generalize. And for so many of our kids, this is their future. You know, yeah. so many people that are going to be interacting, social groups, hanging out online, watching a movie together. You can put their favorite movie on and then put like three cousins on the room too, and they can all watch this movie on the computer together. And yeah anything that you can to make things a little bit different to make them interactive you're going to want to do it this okay 
We've had a lot, we, we, you know, the, the mask conversation, uh, everybody wants to talk about it. So uh, one of our viewers says, for me, it, it isn't a sensory issue, but it gets hot. And I, I know I struggle with that too. Um, one of the things that I've been doing um, is putting some, you know, they have those, those little things that you can order that they're sort of, they're bandanas, but they've got water beads in them and you soak them and you put it around your neck. Or you can simply take a dish towel put it in cold water and put it around your neck. And that mitigates part of what gets hot underneath the mask. I, I don't understand the math of it, but I do know that when, when you're keeping um, the veins around your neck cold, it helps keep everything else, not cold, cold, but cool. It keeps everything else. Um, but it is hard, right, uh, Ev? Because it's, the, you know, there are different, and I do think that that's part of a sensory issue is that it's feeling hot. I, you and know. so many of our kids aren't good at identifying their own physical states. They don't understand. They don't know how to tell people, hey, it's hot. So if you have a neurotypical kid and it gets hot, they're able to say, hey, mom, can I re remove this for a little bit because I'm hot? Parents will say like, yeah, take it off for a little bit. But when we start going again, you need to put it. Yeah. Another person says, my grandson is autistic and nonverbal. And our kids don't know how to communicate that information. So, yeah. So, I mean, just... Give them, you know, give them time away from it too. If they're hot, use this time to teach them to tell you it's really hot over here. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm sorry, and I interrupted you because I uh, are we're cycling a little bit. Um, but um, another person wrote in and said, "My grandson is autistic and nonverbal. He has sensory issues. He cannot wear a mask. He will be four in a few days. I guess uh, he may have to be homeschooled if children have to wear masks all day in school." And she says, ABA services have been canceled, of course, but it's a difficult situation for all. There's so many things in there that I want to talk about, because first of all, you know, it may be that he can't wear the mask today, but he's about to be four, which means that in six months, he, you know, you could work up to it. Uh, and I want Evelyn to talk to you about that. But I also want to talk about this ABA services have been canceled, of course. There's nothing, of course, about that. And I'm going to let Evelyn talk to you about that. <laughs> but everybody, everybody hang on to your magic carpet because she's going to take you someplace. So here we well, go. Well, I mean, there's, <laughs> Shannon, you can have this conversation. But really, ABA services should not be canceled. They should. It's not. an essential service. It's an essential service. Your child, it's a medically necessary service. Mm -hmm. You have to think for every moment that your grandchild is not getting services, they're falling behind. And you do not want that to be there. And I don't want parents to feel bad about it, to feel guilty about it, just do it. They just need to get their services. If their current ABA provider isn't taking anybody, other ABA agencies are. are. And really, whether it's through in-person or through telehealth, they need some type of ABA therapy to get going because you wanna use this time. Even though this time is weird, it's, it's kind of been good for a lot of our kids because it's really focused. There's not a lot of distraction where you're going out of the house to do 10,000 things going on for, with your family. They have to deal with who's there in front of this. And that's learn, dealing is learning how to communicate, learning how to be interactive, not insisting on their own way. And then, so get your ABA, if your ABA provider isn't working right now, work with your funding source and say, hey, I need somebody else. They're not taking it, switch my funding to somebody else. They'll do it if they can find it. You know, just you just you have to be the squeaky wheel here. So yeah. people are crowded, and you know, like maybe they they're not ta they're saying they're not taking someone. You have to keep pushing because if you keep pushing and you keep voicing what you need and that your child is not getting their medical necessity, everybody will help you. Yep, it's true. You and I want to. A lot of ABA providers have continued um, to serve their clients during this great isolation card has continued um, services and offered two different models for people that they could either do in home um, where the, where they would have one therapist or in some cases, two therapists that were just assigned to that family who would just come to their home. Um, and so everybody stayed safe and they, you know, washed their hands like crazy people. But we continued to see families do in-home therapy. And then for other families, they did telehealth therapy. And some families did a, did a hybrid of the two. But as of next week, at many card centers, they're going to be offering a third 
alternative uh, that some of the centers are reopening and for a limited number of clients, they are coming back to the center and doing a lot of things differently and observing social distancing. But so then there will be three choices and it's what the family is comfortable with, right? And what's right for the kiddo. They could be at the center receiving therapy, they could be in the home receiving therapy, or they can receive telehealth therapy where it's just through the computer, nobody's coming into your house. And we've seen kids benefiting and, and doing really well with the two. We already know that they do well in the center. So, um, and you can do a mixture of the three. So yeah. that's what CARD is doing. I would, I would encourage you for the, the, the grandparent that wrote this in, call your ABA provider and say, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is a medically necessary thing. And where's my telehealth? Where, you know, or if you're comfortable with the in-home or if you're in com com if you are comfortable going back to the center, yeah, be, be persistent as Ev said and, and get that going because this is not an of course. Um, and, and, and ask to have the hours that you've missed be made up over the summer so that yep. they don't lose them. Double down, double down folks. Hey, and we're saying, just, go ahead. And then just in regards to the masks, I'm laughing at Instagram right now because so many people that have young kids will wear their masks. <laughs> and so that four-year-old isn't that far away, but it is just a learning process. You wear it for a little, you give them a treat. You wear a little bit more, they get to choose what they like, what it feels like. All of those things, you can teach them how to do this. It's not that hard to do. Okay. Yeah. And there's lots of different kinds of masks. I mean, now they have face shields. They have the little hats the kids can, little babies can wear that have the little shield thing. I mean, you know, think out of the box. But we've seen a lot of four-year-olds. And of course, I would say to this person, get your ABA going and have them help you to have your child wear the mask. Because we've seen a lot of kids that the parents were like, this kid is never going to wear a mask. And they're happily wearing masks now like little troopers. Um, so I love that. We're also saying hi out there to Martha. Hi, Martha. Uh, and we're saying hi to Johanny and Karen and Cindy. Uh, okay, so um, somebody wants to know, Evelyn, I'm pretty mixed up about returning to the center versus telehealth. I feel I have learned so much more from being in his sessions. Yeah. Isn't that a wonderful, like this, many parents have said this, they're like, you know, I would never have chosen this, but now that <laughs> I'm doing telehealth and I'm in their sessions, I've learned so much more and my relationship with my kid is better. I love it. I, it's my favorite thing. Um, but they want to know how can I keep more connected with treatment plans? I'm hugging you because you're yes. the kind of parent I want to hang out with. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right? You know, this is actually, so when I started doing therapy years and years ago, everything was home-based. Every parent was involved whether they wanted to be or not. <laughs> me. I didn't want to, but there I was. <laughs> yeah. And, and then when we went to center-based, I saw the shift in type of parents coming in. It made me sad because I was like, you guys, I, I would talk to the supervisors and say, you have to push the parents to get involved. Because once you're involved, that's like the best thing in the world. But in all honesty, he needs both. Your child needs both. You, we, you know, the fact that you love the sessions at home, keep some sessions at home because that generalization, that rapport that you've built over telehealth, all of that, keep some of that. Because that's what's going to be, that generalization and that there's less time prompt dependency, what I noticed through telehealth, which I love, because mm -hmm. you can't reach through the screen and make the kid do something, <laughs> you know? You have to verbally tell the parent or verbally tell the child, and there's this whole interaction that happens that I just think it's the best thing in the world. And there have been some parents who were totally anti this and have written to me or called me and said, this has been amazing, just like what you're saying. I love the rapport. I love all of this. So I would say that the best thing to do is to do a hybrid. Okay, because one thing that happens in centers that doesn't happen in home is they have to get used to all the people around. The spontaneity, the distraction, the noise in the environment, all of those things are helpful because once they go to school, you know, there's a thousand distractions. And I love, that's one thing I actually love about having the perspective of having worked in a home and working in the center is when I go to centers now, when I travel and there is so much ruckus going outside and our little kids there just working along, just doing what they need to do. And they're not getting distracted by the kid crying, the thing that fell, whatever it is. And they, all of that is super valuable too. Because I'll 
home setting's nice. You can't recreate the weird noises and distractions that happen. People come screaming through, you know, the sudden switching of people working with you. That generalization aspect of having, you know, adults just walking in and in they're being forced to say hello and say goodbye. And, and um, just that aspect of it is, it would be lost if you went to an all home or all telehealth model. And your child really does need that center base. But wait till you feel safe. That's what we're telling everybody, right? Yeah. Really hard with the rollout of, of center base. We're being very, very careful. If you are not, if your child was not chosen to return to center, don't worry about it, okay? Because we are starting extremely careful we're making sure that the social distancing is all there. We're making sure like hand sanitizer, hand washing routines, toileting routine. And she's frozen on my screen. We're really we starting. Okay, so. Uh, thank you, Evelyn. And, and yeah, you know, and, and don't forget that you can come back slowly, um, you know, and you can do the mix. And the other thing, the other thing I want to plug here before we move on is uh, because the main question was how can I keep more connected with the treatment plans? Um, at CARD, we have something called caregiver collaboration. And I just, I just want to give a big, big shout out for it. And if you're not at CARD, I want to encourage you to be asking for this with your other providers. Caregiver collaboration is set time for the parent to sit down with a senior member of the team and to talk about anything that you want to talk about. So I always tell parents, make a list, like what's the hardest part of the day? And they'll help you to work on that from your end, right? Like how do you make things work for you? How, you know, and the parent who goes, I just, like a lot of the things that you guys ask here are things that you would bring into your caregiver collaboration. I just can't get him to brush his teeth in the morning fast enough so that we can get to school on time. Like those are the things that you can work on. And it's also an ideal time for you if you're as into it as I think that you are and as I wish everybody was to go, okay, so let's sit down and look at the program and what's coming around the corner and what do I need to be preparing for? That's what your caregiver collaboration is for. And, and most of you, like there's a lot of time that your funding source will give for caregiver collaboration. And I don't know anybody who uses all of it because most of the time parents are too busy. So you can request more. You can say, I would like to have two hours um, to go through all this, or I would like to have four hours. I would like to have an hour a week where I sit down or, you know, in telehealth with the supervisor and talk about what we're doing. To, they'll give it to you. Your funding source almost across the board will give it to you. So don't forget to ask for that caregiver collaboration. And, uh, anything you want to add to that, Ev? Yeah. And I loved caregiver collaboration, but you can use it creatively in any way that helps for you and your whole family. So I like, you know, when I used to do parent training, what old school, what we would call it, um, I was like in the family. It wasn't just train the parent, it was train the siblings, train nanny, train everybody that lived in that household or came in out a lot, grandparents, and use that mindset. Because right now we're kind of limited of where we're going. But if there's people that you know mean a lot to you and who come through, bring them over during your session and get them some training. Get you know everybody that gets a little bit more education about you know whether it's your child or ABA or how to do things is going to be that much more meaningful in terms of the interaction that they're creating with you and your family. So just, Absolutely. just all of it. Like you know, we used to joke with um, parents because parents didn't want to say who I was sometimes. <laughs> You know, they didn't exactly tell everybody, you know, about diagnosis and things, but they would always be like, this is a friend and family. And she said, here, just like, you know, can you tell them about this or whatever it may be? And I used to joke because I'd be like, um, yeah, this is a weird interaction. Like, can I just like, how much can I say about myself and how much I'm helping you? And they would give me you know, their limits or whatever. But, you know, the more people involved, the better it is for your child. And that's what you're here for, you know, in terms of treatment planning. Look on skills. If you are a hard family, you go on to skills. And if you, it's a lot and it's overwhelming. But you know, what parents have found is they go to the pages that they like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can ignore everything else because there's a lot of information in there and it can be overwhelming. But talk to your BCBA and say like, okay, this is what I want to know. What's the best way to do this? You know, and they, they will tell you. There's like in skills, there's a, a report on just all the notes that people have taken 
And a lot of families just like that. You can go in, put in the dates that you want, the date range, and I'm only looking at the notes that people are writing and it tells me a lot. You know, so there's just different things depending on what you're interested in, what your kid's working on. It might change, but definitely reach out to your BCBA. And I just want to say, for those of you who are watching, skills, uh, it's skillsforautism.com. And all card um, families have uh, a free account uh, with skills, but any family could have an account with skills. It is a subscription. Um, they are giving 10% off if you call right now and say that you watched on Autism Live. Um, but it is, it is a great thing. I always say it's like a mall. Like you're never going to go to a mall and go into every single store. But go to the, you go to the mall knowing that there's something that you want to get. And if along the way you see another store that you happen to walk into and then that becomes your new favorite store, great. But don't think that you can go to every store in the mall. Like Disneyland. You're not going to go on every a ride. Um, you know, not the first time. So uh, you go in, get what you want, and, um, and it's there right? Because it's, it's like a mall. It's got everything. Hey, I want to point out that the grandmother who wrote in before who said that they were, weren't getting ABA services, of course, said she cor corrected herself and said, I should have said ABA services in the home have been canceled, but he has been getting services through telehealth, which makes me feel much better. But I would push them. A lot of ABA providers, you know, CARD has been doing it in the home and, and see if they're not doing it now, they will be starting it soon. So he is getting services every day, just not one-to-one -one in the home only, and I feel much better about that. Uh, hey, we're saying hi to Cindy, and we're saying hi to Alana. Alana Gershlovitz is watching, and she says Evelyn is the best. We all agree with her, but, but Alana, I, I would argue that you're the best too. So there we go. We have a, uh, a battle going on. Uh, hey, Cindy wants to know, my son is five years old, an ASD twin. He's been more anxious and has been mouthing, biting much more. I've gotten the chew toys and he, he spent, it like she says, he spent like them and has been biting random things, mostly plastic. Any tips for Cindy? Oh, Evelyn's frozen. Uh -huh. Oh, no, no, you're, oh, no. you're frozen. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of anxiety right now, definitely across the board. So any type of warning to activity changes to what's coming next, you want to give those warnings to your child. And it might be, depending on the age and the ability of communication, it might be in the form of pictures or videos instead of like, hey, this is what we're doing next. And you show them a picture of what you did yesterday, you know, or... Like even for upcoming bath time, you can video a little bit about their bath and saying, this is what we're doing next and just showing them a little bit about your bath. I mean, that's the amazing part of technology is you can prime kids and warn them in, in much more meaningful ways than ever before. The other thing is in terms of biting, my, I actually have a very specific, um, I don't know, bent towards I don't like chewies at all. Mm. Mm. <laughs> the kid's going to chew. I want them eating food because most of our kids actually have some kind of eating issue too. So I actually redirect all chewies into food form. And, you know, like anything that's a gummy, you can put in the refrigerator when it gets cold, it gets really hard. And you can have them chew that gummy fruit or whatever it is, that dried fruit. If, you, if your kid doesn't eat protein, I'm almost immediately sticking some kind of like turkey jerky or something in front of you so that your kid can gnaw on that jerky and just get that stimulation through there. Because I'm a firm believer that if your child doesn't chew, it's very difficult to talk. And so many of our kids, when I ask parents, like, does your kid chew when they eat? They say, yes. I said, no, go back and look. And they'll come back and say, oh, they don't chew. They just kind of smack and then they swallow. And yeah. You know, I always say, let's teach this child how to chew. Work with that speech therapist, figure out, and that OT, figure out what areas of the mouth they're not using. You probably already know when you're trying to brush their teeth. You they, like, you know, jump back from, and you know what, you know, they, it's okay. It's like nothing's there. And then you probably know about the sensitivities in their mouth already, so that you can work with that OT and that speech person to figure out what are things that I can use to address this, and how can I get this going? And the thing is, it might be an anxiety reaction, but a lot of times what I've realized with the chewing is it's also a reaction to something that's changed. Maybe some food item has changed or some activity that they used to do. Um, you know, maybe it could just be talking less, you know, 
And so then now they're using their mouths to engage in other ways. And there is a developmental aspect to this too. Like when families come in and the kids are young, I'll say, did they ever go through the that um, period of time where they're putting everything in their mouth to figure out what things are, discovery periods. And if they, if they did, but now they're doing it again, I'm going to treat it more like a behavioral or sensory issue. But let's say they never did that. I'm going to let them do it on a safe way, but then try to move them towards the next stages. You can figure out things by interacting with them using your hands, touching them, you know, that are learning about sensations and what and all of the, you know, whatever the sensations are that you can start teaching them in other ways on that sensory development aspect. I start teaching that. And usually when that happens, they don't stay very long in that developmental a stage of mouthing because it's not safe. And then there's sometimes kids just mouth because they have nothing else to do. And if that's going to ask, if that's going to be it, then you need to be in, enriching their environment. That means therapy. That means giving them new things to focus on, new things to be aware of, new things to learn how to do. And a lot of times just by giving them more information that meets their criteria of whether it's the sensory or whether it's just learning more and being more active and discovering other things, their attention will go away from all of the, you know, the other types of activity too. So just like a lot of our kids right now, I mean, boredom is bad, but for our kids that don't know how to structure themselves this time if you're home and you don't have a routine for them and you don't have a structured kind of day for them life is really really hard without that routine you know yesterday i was talking to shannon i said you know for me on the weekends i can like i want that lazy wake up you know it's just exhausting to wake up every day but for our kids on the spectrum they need to wake up and know that there's something to do right away because if you let them slowly engage into the day, chances are they're not engaging with people and they're usually engaging in some type of stereotypy because they don't know what else to do. And getting them out of that stereotypy, let's say if you start a therapy at noon, is a lot harder than if you did it right from when they woke up. Because when they wake up and you teach them how to structure their day and they can follow instructions, it's like their whole day is much more organized than that sleepy time of giving them four hours to do nothing before they start up again. It's actually, I've seen it, be harder for the kids when they have kind of that lazy wake up time rather than starting right from the beginning in the morning. So think about it. Hey, we're saying hi to Steve and the mom who said that uh, she was learning so much from telehealth. She said, I felt like I was on top of things, but man, has it been awesome. I want to have you write a whole blog about what it's been like for you as a parent. Um, because I think there are still people who are afraid of it and I think it would help them, but I'm not, I'm, uh, you know, I know you're busy. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody else who said they're uplifted and they said, thank you so much for doing these. Um, but one of the parent writes in and says, excellent. Your lect lectures are, but would you please help me to guide, um, so that my child trains to go to the bathroom. He has severe autism and he is 17 years old. Oh, so hard. Yeah. 17 years of a habit is really hard to break. Okay, so. But not impossible. Not impossible, I've done a 40 year old. <laughs> there you go, there you go. It took a lot of work, I mean, it's a lot of work though because when they're little and you're toilet training them, you can pick them up and move them. When they're 17, you can. But better to do it at 17 than 25, right? Hmm? Better to do it at 17 than 25, right? Oh, definitely. So and, now and is the time. Now is the time because you just have to think any habit that goes longer is really hard to break. The more years involved. Plus, so which we're now, all stuck at home. We're all stuck yeah. at home right now. So now is the ideal time to be working on this. And honestly, so there's a lot of different, depending on how, who's there, you want, you're going to need somebody who's going to physically be able to block him. Like if he's, because he's going to try running out of the bathroom and all these other things. So you do need people who are going to really help. And whenever I'm toilet training an adult, I'm always saying, how many uncles can I bring over? <laughs> you know, because they need to be around because they need to force him. Like, no, you can't come out of here until you go in that bathroom. Like, you just have to do this. But before you even get there, the main component before any toilet training for any child, any age, is they have to be compliant. That means when you tell them sit down, stand up, whatever it is, that they generally do it, but they also know that when they do it, there is some reward for it for them at the end of it. Because then 
if they know that they follow your instruction, there is going to be something good that comes from it. At the beginning, it might be some reinforcer that is like you're handing him, like here, you can play a certain game if you're doing this. But, uh, uh, but sometimes it's just giving them a type of food that they want, you know, whatever it may be. And, but at some point though, there has to be, you have to have compliance where they're going to do what you say. So what I tell people is like really work on compliance for a good three months. And you know, it might not take three months, but if you really just work on just basic compliance skills to do just the easy things in life, once you get compliance and he knows if I do this, there's going to be something in it for me, you can do toilet training then. Because everything that you've asked of him, there is always a reason, there's a benefit, there's something good that comes out of it. So as long as he knows that, now that you're asking him for toilet training, you can do it. And you start slow. You also have to see, rule out any biomedical issues. If your child has a ton of diarrhea or GI issues, you're gonna need to address that first. Because no matter how compliant they are, no matter how, um, what good you know, routine you put in for a toilet training, if your child has no control over their bowels or their, you know, um, their, their, their bathroom, um, just their GI tract, it's very hard because there's no control. So get, go see those doctors, figure out like what foods is making you know, them biomedically, the, what is actually messing up their GI system. Figure that out so that the child can actually have some control. Because I know in so, many, so much of our ASD population, there are biomedical issues that around their GI tract. And if your child just suddenly has diarrhea, there's no, you have no control. And then your child has no control, no matter how much you're doing toilet training. The minute but make I sure all the, that's addressed. I, like, but just really go through and rule out the biomedical. If you get compliance, you rule out the biomedical, you're ready to go. Figure out what reinforcers are ready. Start taking things away that you're going to reserve just the highest for the toilet training. Um, use the Azrin and Fox, you know, method. It it works. You just for a 17 year old, it just takes longer. You know, okay. you're party for a few days it might be a, a month or two or three of doing this not in that extreme it'll get but still you might don't give up because he's had 17 years to have this habit of not using the toilet <laughs> yeah you can give a more time to counter it and so many people have been writing in in the last couple of weeks with all kinds of questions about potty training and we just keep saying Azrin and Fox, Azrin and Fox, Azrin and Fox. I want to make sure you guys know how to spell it A-Z-R-I-N and F-O-X-X -X. Um, and it is the the proven method of toilet training that has worked across the board for I mean like how many experts have we had on in 10 years and I always ask them is there anybody that you've not been able to get potty trained the answer is no, it just takes longer amounts of time with some people than with others, but it works. It absolutely works. You can Google it. We've got a show planned coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Where we're just going to devote the time to Fox and Azrin and toilet training and what you do and what you don't do. Um, but you can Google it today. There are books on it and um, it's pretty, you know, uh, regimented but you have to follow it and, you, and it, it means that for at least a period of time you have to like not be going on a trip you know now <laughs> like there's no better time than now uh, we, always at the end of the hour everybody writes in with the best questions I'm gonna try to get through as many as these as I can um, so there was one about meltdowns what do you do when your son has a meltdown and yells for a very long time I won't Okay, you need a BCBA to come in here and to do a functional assessment or, you know, on your child. I can't really realistically give you good uh, feedback, but usually before they have that meltdown, there's a lot of clues they give you. Mm -hmm. Something is not going the way they want. Something is not, they give you clues. It's just, you just have to be very in tune to them. Like if they start twitching or if they start pacing or whatever it is, you're going to be able to figure out what that is. And there's different reasons too. You know, with functional behavior, you know, sometimes it's for attention. If I yell and scream, everybody comes and runs to me and that's great and awesome. And so now I know that every time I want people to come near me, I just have to scream and yell and have a meltdown. Sometimes it's because the only time they get access to what they want is by yelling and screaming. And unfortunately, that is a big one. Sometimes yelling and screaming is a function of avoidance or escape. 
in classrooms, it's amazing how the minute the kid decides they don't want to be. She's stuck so, again. Here we go. <laughs> you know, so there's different reasons for those meltdowns and they will give you clues. And, but you need someone to come in and do a functional assessment and just really figure out like, what are the functions? And it might be different functions at different times in different settings. But a lot of times, and it's really, there's a lot, the lack of communication that when we started this hour when we were talking, I was saying so many of the kids just don't know how to communicate. Tantrums and meltdowns are not a function of the diagnosis of autism. It's basically the result of not being able to communicate, not understanding social interaction that that's why most of our kids end up in some type of problem behavior is they know that this is the only way they're going to get access to whatever it is they're needing in the moment so really you want you want someone to come in and help you figure out like what is the reason he's doing this why and then create a behavior plan yeah you absolutely need some help and support but as you are reaching out and getting somebody to come in save yourself some time we talk about this all the time on the show i'm too, it's too white you're not going to be able to see on my paper i folded it into thirds and it has a b c and you're going to start to fill this out so that when the expert comes they're going to already have some background so the a stands for antecedent the b stands for the behavior and the c stands for the consequence so when your kid throws a tantrum you immediate, and this is going to help you when they're having the meltdown, because as soon as I started to do this as a parent, instead of standing there and thinking, oh my gosh, she's doing the tantrum again. I don't know what it is. It's random. It's autism. This is going to be the rest of my life. My life is over. We're never going to be happy. We're never going to be able to do anything. He's never going to have the, you know, you cycle. Instead, you stand there and think, okay, I got to remember so I can write down what exactly is he doing for the behavior? Oh, look, he's spitting. Oh, now he's throwing things. It just helps you to get removed from it, right? So you write, the first thing you write down is what the behavior looked like, right? Then you write down what was the consequence for it. What happened afterwards? Did you end up giving in? Don't judge yourself. Just put it on the paper, right? You know, did, did somebody else give him a lollipop afterwards, whatever? And then when you're all done, you go back and you're a detective and you go, what was happening right before? I don't know. I fed him gummy bears. Um, right. And it does, and, and it was two o'clock in the afternoon and I asked him to put on his shoes, whatever, but you'll start to, and then you draw a line and then you put in the next one. And after a week, you're going to, you'll start to see some patterns. And when you hand this to the BCBA that you have coming in, they will just drool all over you and want to work with you. And it will be much quicker because they'll go, Oh, this tells me the whole story right here. Um, and if you want to know more about that, we talk about, it's called the three-term contingency. We talk about it in our jargon thing, and you guys can check it out. But anybody who's having challenging behavior, if you start to keep one of these sheets and you talk to your expert about it, it's going to supercharge what happens. Um, can I move on to a, a question where I want to hug this dad? He says, my son is on the spectrum um, for autism. He is nonverbal. He has an eating disorder. He takes off his diaper and plays with and eats his poo. It's so frustrating for us as 25 year old parents. Thank you for your time. I am hugging you. You're going to be awesome. This is, uh, you know, what a, what a great, great dad that's here and writing in and asking this question. 25 years old, lean in because we got you. Uh, Evelyn, what can we do for this young man? This young okay, dad? so you blanked out on part of that. <gasps> <gasps> no! Okay, so the son is uh, on the spectrum for autism. He's nonverbal. He has an eating disorder, and he takes off his diaper and plays with and eats his poo. And it's very frustrating for this couple. They're 25 years old, trying to be good parents, um, and they want to know what they should do. Find your local BCBA, <laughs> and he needs therapy. Sounds like he's still really young. You guys are 25, so he can't be that old. So that's great news. The younger, you know, he's still young. So don't worry so much about the classifications or the diagnoses, the eating disorder, the autism. I always just say, you know what? Your child's a child. Let's look and see what's difficult, what's easy for him, what does he love. Really look at it separately and, you know, Therapy at this point when he's young is going to be the best thing for him because that eating disorder, not really an eating disorder yet, okay? It's not. It's a function usually of maybe, you know, we have kids who they had reflux when they were babies and no one ever really knew. They spit up a lot and suddenly they're eating foods and it doesn't feel good, so they just stop eating because it just, it's the consequence thing. They, every time I eat something, I feel bad. And 
You know, it could be that. It could be sensory. He doesn't like the feeling. Or it could be, I've had kids who got burned by hot food and then just are like, we're not doing that anymore. You don't know what it is. So it's not exactly a disorder. It really is just figuring out like, what is, what will be? Can the, get you look for the clues? You be that detective. It's like, he will eat these things. You can write it all down. What do these things have in common? Oh, they're all the same color. <laughs> and believe me, that's actually a common one. <laughs> the kids that only eat it by color. And, you know, like after I had kids, my typical kid, I, she, I remember my youngest telling me like, you're not supposed to eat green things. <laughs> you walk on grass, that's green. And I thought, oh wow, typical kids do this too. But the thing is, you know, get therapy, get some help, go see, make, if you're concerned about their health, go get a good pediatrician. A pediatrician who specializes with kids on the autism spectrum is gonna be the best help to you. You, you, so you'll have your typical pediatrician for your daily, you know, regular needs and go and get, you know, look and see if there's any biomedical issues, you know, for that pediatrician that actually has experience with kids on the spectrum. Um, really, this is the time you're 25. That means you have a lot of energy, <laughs> <I'm not laughs> but you're going to be the best parents because you're going to be like, you're not that far away from them. So you're going to be able, you'll have, you'll be jumping up and down with them on the trampoline just, just so that they can say their first word. You'll She's frozen. All these things. You'll be doing all these things. Yeah, very hard path, but there's a lot of good things that are going to come. Absolutely. And I just want to put it in your back pocket that I want you to go to www.tacanow.org. That's TACA, which is ta uh, the Autism Community in Action. Um, and you're going to find support of a lot of young parents that are there for a lot of different things. A lot of what Evelyn just said to you about making sure that you go to a doctor because when kids are engaging in eating their poo, sometimes it's a mineral deficiency and you wanna know what mineral. You don't wanna, you don't wanna guess. But you're gonna find a lot of parents on TACA that have a similar experience to you. They've got all kinds of workarounds. Like um, there are special pajamas that um, where, you know, you cut off the feet and you like summer weight pajamas and they zip up the back or they snap up the back so the kid can't get in a diaper, um, which is going to slow a lot of things down. So I want to encourage you to go to, find a pediatrician, but lean into those talker groups. They're doing a monthly coffee talk that's virtual now. It's free. Um, and, and you're going to get some you're going to get some good support from other young parents. I think you're going to find your tribe um, and, and start to like one by one tick off the things that are the most frustrating, that are kicking your can the most, that are making you mentally go, oh my gosh, I'm 25 and I have this kid and I don't understand what to do. One by one, you're going to be like, oh, now I know what to do about that. And now he's not eating the poo out of his diaper anymore. Woohoo. You know, now we're going to move on to he's not sleeping and we're going to crush that one. Um, and you know, by the time you're 30 and he's older, it's going to be, you know, you're going to be like, look at how great I am. Uh, <laughs> yep. and you're going to be like, look at how great my kid is. Um, so, and, and along the way you might find that I hope you are doing some ABA therapy to, to get as much language happening, whether it ends up being vocal speech or that he's communicating on a device because if you don't get that functional communication piece he is going to act out because if you can't get your needs met any of us doesn't matter autism or not if i can't get my needs met i get mad and i throw a tantrum yep so there we go um we did not get to all the questions but we we did what we could Hey, Evelyn, you are the best and we just adore you. And thank you so much for, for being here with us. And I, I, the, the great news is that we are going to have Evelyn back again next week. So if you want your question answered, send it to me um, and we'll make sure that it gets on the list for next week. And I want to say a special thank you. I want to say hi to David and a special thank you to Diana who wrote in and answered a question for us that we didn't get to about SSDI. Thank you, Diana. We appreciate that. Thank you so much, Evelyn. We're back tomorrow with Bonnie Yates. If you guys have legal questions, you got questions about the ESY, she's our special education attorney. She's going to be with us tomorrow. I'm taking questions right now. You can send them to me at s.penrod at autism-live.com. And then of course on Friday, we have licensed and marriage and family therapist, Vince Redman. So if you have questions of that kind of nature, he's on Friday. So it's not a what's on first, uh, who's on second. It's 
Bonnie tomorrow and Vince on Friday. That's what we're talking about. Thank you all. We'll be back then. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and I'm coming to you from my house. And we're going to have uh, guests coming to you from their houses. So, uh, or house, I think, because we're just having one guest today. So thrilled to be here with you. It's Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Um, and today's a little different for us because uh, we didn't have a Monday. Uh, well, we did have a Monday. We just did something different with our Monday. We did our Temple Grandin Marathon, and I'm still trying to go through and answer as many of the questions as I can on the Temple Grandin Marathon. I spoke to Temple briefly yesterday. I got to call her again today and see when she's going to be back on the show. But, you know, they were doing the, uh, they were attempting to do this, the historic SpaceX SpaceX launch with NASA astronauts. And for those of you who geek on the space stuff like Temple and I do, I once I knew what was happening, because I, I guess I just have been a little out of touch. And once I had the live feed, I was like, I got to call Temple. And uh, I called her and I said, Temple, are you watching this? And she goes, no, 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 I'm trying to get done with what I'm doing so that I can go do it. And she goes, but the launch isn't for like 45 more minutes, is it? And I said, yes, but Temple, they're showing all the stuff that you would be grooving on right now and her response you're gonna love this temple was like oh well, i better get down there because i want to groove on that <laughs> and that just made me how i was like yes that is my conversation today with temple Grandin, uh because I, I know how much uh excitement she gets going for that kind of stuff because i have the same excitement for it and then of course if you were watching it they had they had a weather scrub that the weather was not going to work uh there was too much the electricity in the air. They were afraid of lightning strikes. So it was this whole thing. They had already pumped the fuel into the rockets. You see, I can geek out on it. And, uh, and then they had to pump the fuel out and the astronauts had to sit there while they did it. Uh, I got to call Temple because I'm sure she was loving every second of it like I was too. But I, I, I know, like, honestly, Temple and I should have a thing where we narrate it because we would be like, okay, so what is that thing that they just touched right there? What does that, we, you know, we're the inquiring minds. Wouldn't that be fun? They should do that. NASA should have Temple and I do a side uh, podcast while they're doing live of just us talking about, so what was that? Uh, why did they do that? That would be super fun. Anyway, uh, thrilled to be here with you on this Thursday morning. So typically on Monday, we have Bonnie Yates, but it was Labor Day. We couldn't do that. Uh, we were having a Temple Grand and Marathon. So we have Bonnie Yates is going to be joining with us today. It's really laggy, they're telling me. Okay, so I'm going to ask my husband if he can give me the cord to the, the back of the TV and hope that he hears me. Uh, so I apologize if it's laggy, but we're going to try to switch to Ethernet. Um, so anyway, I uh, want to remind you guys, there's lots of ways to be in touch with us this morning. Hey, look at all those people saying hi. Hi, Connie. Hi, Avani. Hi, Gamal. Hi, Gina. Hi, Israel. Hi, Gamal. I already said Gamal once, but we'll say it twice. 
because uh, they said hello to me and hello to everyone. So uh, anyway, uh, there are lots of ways for you guys to connect with us, and we hope that you will participate in whatever way makes sense for you. We are live right now on autism-live.com, and you can chat with us there at the bottom of the page, but you can also chat with us on YouTube, on Periscope, on Facebook Live, um, Twitter, and then later on, we will podcast to iTunes, Deezer, iHeartRadio, Spotify, we're everywhere you want to be. And if there are places that you do like to be that are not listed on this thing, hey, 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 just write to us and tell us all about it and we'll see if we can get on there. We like to be places where you can get to us for free. That's sort of how we like to roll because um, I don't want to have you incur any extra expense in order to be here with us. We're about information and inspiration, not charging you. Uh, we like to have other people pay for that, <laughs> right? Uh, so anyway, that's we've been doing that for almost nine years now. So we, we, we try really hard to keep it that way. But what keeps the lights on is you guys watching. So uh, please subscribe, tell other people, share, uh, do a review for us on iTunes. Oh my goodness, that helps us a lot. Um, but definitely like and share and subscribe. That's the name of the game and the review on iTunes. Uh, hey, Jimbo, can you give me the cord? Um, very professional. I have uh, production assistants here. <laughs> I need the cord from the, because uh, we have, we're, it's laggy today. So anyway, sorry about that. Uh, but it's just, there's, there's no finesse anymore, folks, to this doing stuff at all. Anyway, um, I also want to let you know that our show, which is Information and Inspiration, is for the larger autism community. We are talking, of course, uh, to that core of the autism community that are folks that are on the spectrum. We want to provide them information and inspiration and resources so that they can lead the life that they want to lead, that it lead that is important to them um, because what's important to me is not the ticket. I got to find the hole here to put it in the computer. There we go. This, uh, I do not want to leave the Whoa. meeting. I'm touching things that, and now my dog's barking. It could get worse. <laughs> Stick around. Uh, but anyway, thank you, honey. Uh, there we go. So um, anyway, uh, so of course we're talking to individuals and talking with individuals who are on the autism spectrum. But in addition to that, we like to include everyone who loves them, that greater autism community. So it's like, boom, boom, um, because we want to give their voice that, that megaphone. It's like Horton hears a who, you know, the, the, they, you got to get everybody together to, to speak, to be heard, right? So um, we're trying to provide information and inspiration to that entire community. Uh, I'm a part of that community um, because I'm a very proud mom of an individual who was diagnosed with autism when he was two and a half. And I got super lucky. I got stupid lucky, right? I, um, you know, was on the floor praying and saying, help me to help. And I, and the help came. And a part of that deal on the floor was show me what to do and I'll do it. And I did, you know, and, and we worked really hard and my son worked really hard and a whole bunch of people at the center for autism and related disorders worked really hard. Uh, but on top of that, we got lucky, um, you know, because different people learn at different rates and, and my son learned pretty quickly and he has a full rich life now that, you know, I mean, does his brain work differently than mine? Absolutely. And thank God, right? <laughs> like seriously, thank God. Um, but is he disabled? No. And if anybody wants to have that street fight with me, go ahead. Uh, cause there's no part of him that's disabled. He's so much more able than I am. So I want to help you guys to get to that or as close to that as you can get to. I'm not about wanting to change anybody's, uh, you know, thinking, uh, I don't want to change my, it's interesting. Last night I watched the new, uh, Hannah Gadsby Douglas. Ooh, there's some controversy there. Uh, but she's a, an amazing funny, intelligent, brilliant woman uh, who identifies as being on the autism spectrum. And she, woo, that's worth watching on Netflix, but get ready. It's a little, you know, there's some stuff in there. <laughs> and she says, I'm gonna make you a little uncomfortable. And there is some stuff, especially for men. Woo! 
she doesn't hold any punches. So anyway, I just think it's really interesting and worthwhile for the whole autism community to take a peek at that. Um, anyway, I, I got all these things going on. Um, and I want to get to the jargon of the day, but you know what? Yesterday we were having a problem on our um, on our website, and so we couldn't. We were doing um, Ask Evelyn Kong, and, and a question, two questions came in. One that I'm not qualified to answer, and I'm going to have to wait for an expert. But you know, I want people to know that I saw it. But there was another question that came in on the live feature, and I did announce. Don't put anything on the live feature because it's not working. Um, but then it got working during the show, and that's why there were two, and that's why I didn't see them. So um, I wanted to address this one. I have a nearly seven-year-old son on the spectrum who is high-functioning. We have been doing ABA since he was two until he was about five years old. Services sort of stopped once we moved to a new state and we were on a waste, wait list and we didn't hear back. And I, have been pro, I haven't been proactive about it because honestly, I needed a break. I wanted to find out if there are any types of guidelines or developmental tests we can administer at home so I can determine what are the things that I should be working on for him developmentally? And of course, it's just one out on that. Uh, here we go. For example, I'm having him work on tying his shoes, learning left to right things like that, but I'm not sure what other goals or targets to address. I picked up very well on the ABA process as well as what motivates my son. And I'm confident that I can create programs myself. My question really is, are there any free resources that can guide me towards what I should be working on for him at this point? And they say, thank you. And I just wanted to let you know that I, you know, I am not aware of any other free resources except for us that talk about the kinds of things that you're working on. And I gotta be honest, for what you're asking for, I don't think autism, we're going to, you know, it's going to be hit and miss. You're going to tune in and you go, oh, I should be working on that. But you don't want to be hit and miss. You want to be targeted and go, okay, this is my individual kid. This is exactly where he is. And these are the things that I should be working on him to maximize learning time, right? Anything less than that is the potential to spin your wheels and you don't have time. Time is of the essence when somebody is five years old. So I don't have a free resource for you, but I have a fairly inexpensive resource for you that's going to be able to give you everything that you want, and that's skills. So I want to encourage you to go to skillsforautism.com. I want you to um, ask them if they'll give you a trial membership. Uh, I don't know that they do this anymore. They used to do the thing where you gave them your credit, your credit card on day one, and they didn't charge it till day 15. And you had all that period of time to cancel it on the day of the 15th, you didn't cancel, then they charged your credit card, right? I don't know if they still do that, to be honest with you, but go to the website, check it out. Uh, because I always talk about the fact that skills is like going to a shopping mall, right? When you go to a mall, you don't go to go to every single store. You just don't. Nobody's going to do that. You go and you say, hey, I'm going to go to Macy's. But then once you go to Macy's, you go, you know, I got a little extra time. Maybe I'll go to Starbucks. And you go to Starbucks and then you get pulled into the Apple store. That's, but you don't go to every single store in the mall and you don't like go and go, all right, well, now I got to go to this one. I can't go to this one next. You go where you want to go. And if you look at skills that way, you'll love it. It's big. It's a big shopping mall and it's got everything that you need in it. Don't try to shop everywhere at the same, you know, on the same day. Um, so decide before you go into skills, what am I looking for today? And it looks like to me, what you're looking for is an assessment that links exactly to skills that are specific to the child. Skills has that. Um, and so what you would do is you would go in, you would take the assessment. They're gonna, it's a lot of questions. You gotta pace yourself. It's not something you can do in a day, but you can do it in 14 days if you put your mind to it. And what it does when you're done, it shows you exactly where your child is, exactly what the difference between them and if they weren't behind were and which skills those are, and it links directly to those skills. And it says to you, here's how we would recommend you work on them in what order. Pretty good, right? Now, if you end up making it past, if you end up staying at, with skills, if they give you the 14 day free trial, there is a 10% discount right now for if you go there for Autism Live. Um, I love skills. Uh, I, I, we don't advertise anybody on this program if I don't personally endorse it. Like, just I'm not going to do that, right? Um, so, but I love skills. I absolutely love skills. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. Does so many different things, and um, they will give you a 10% discount if you tell them that I sent you over. 
And if they don't, let me know, because they're supposed to. <laughs> Skillsforautism.com. That is what you need. Um, but it is a monthly subscription. Um, so maybe you subscribe for a month and, and tootle around in it and find all the things that you want to want to find. Um, but you might end up staying for a while longer. I want to say that the monthly subscription is around $70 a month, but then you would get the 10% discount. If you, if that, listen, when I started in the, you know, uh, being an autism mom, that would have been, I couldn't have afforded that. I could not have afforded that. So don't feel shame if $70 a month is too much for you. There are places that will give grants for that specifically, uh, autism care today, um, will give grants for skills. They love to give grants for skills because for them, it's a very small price, it's, you know, uh, seven times 12 for the year. And knowing that somebody is going to get all that great information, they're very happy to give subscriptions, uh, but you got to apply, you got to do all that stuff. Okay. Uh, we uh, are running late now already, but I want to squeeze in time for the jargon. So don't forget, we have experts on the show. I'm not one of them but I care deeply and want to help you to get to the progress that you need. You know, I look like a crazy person because I've got my hair. Uh, <laughs> it's just my, that my OCD and this COVID thing. I just got to keep cutting my hair. What can I tell you? Uh, but anyway, let's take a look at our, the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to figure out what in the hey, nani, nani, are these experts talking about what does it have to do with us? I keep shaking the table. I got a new desk and I keep shaking it. Sorry. Uh, that's why the, the camera moves. Um, I'm going to put my hands underneath my thighs so I won't do it. So we try to figure out what are we talking about? What does it have to do with us? Why are we doing that? So today's jargon term, there it is, alphabet land. Uh, and this is relatively new alphabet land, RBT. What in the heck is an RBT? And I'm going to tell you that if you have a kiddo that's getting ABA, this is a term you're going to hear, especially some insurance requires that the people who work with your kiddo aren't just therapists uh, that have been trained. They have to have a specific certification, and that is the RBT. So let's take a look. What is the actual definition? What does RBT stand for? It stands for registered behavior technician. All right, and let's go on right to our working definition so that we can figure out what this designation means. Um, so an RBT is an individual who has been certified to show that they understand the basic tenets of applied behavior analysis. So what it is, is that uh, many years ago, as insurance started to cover ABA, they were like, well, you know, uh, parents are telling us that some of their therapists are great and some of them are mediocre and some of them are just bleh, right. And that it's, there's no like across the board um, a surety of what you're going to get. And insurance likes to, you know, if they're going to spend the money. They want to know that they're spending it and that you're getting something of a certain quality. Right. Um, and for instance, at CARD, therapists go through an extensive training before they ever see a kiddo and then another extensive training before they ever work with a kiddo. But not all the ABA providers do that. In fact, for many years, and I don't know why I'm laughing about it, there's nothing funny about it, uh, our uh, uh, therapists would go through CARD training and then other ABA providers would hire them away and pay them just a dollar more an hour, but they would know that they had the benefit of the CARD training. It was a really shady, shady thing to do. Um, because a lot of ABA, ABA providers just didn't want to spend the amount of money that they would have to spend to train somebody. It's many, 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 many hours. Um, but eventually insurance stepped in and said, look, you know, we, we got to have some sort of a, a metric here. So they invented um, the art, well, not insurance, but somebody invented this designation and went to insurance companies and said, hey, at least, you know, if they, you'll know that if they've done this process, that they have a certain level of understanding. They didn't just walk in off the street. They have some understanding of ABA. Great. That's wonderful. Um, now, there were other people in, in the autism community who went to insurance company and said, well, you know, the, the thing about this is that depending on the training that they do for an RBT, 
it, they're going to be trained in applied behavior analysis, but not necessarily applied behavior analysis for autism. So another designation was made, and that's a BCAT. That's a board certified autism technician. So um, when you talk to your therapist, you know, you can ask them, and when you talk to your insurance company, what is it that you require? Some require an RBT, some require a BCAT. The truth is, is that more, uh, my understanding is that more insurance companies re right now require an RBT, but if you think about it, um, you know, as a parent, I would rather know that somebody had autism training with their ABA, not just ABA. Um, but there are trainings that are online that you can, you as a parent or as a person on the spectrum can do the same training. I've done the training. Um, and there's, I love IBT because if you do the IBT training, it's the same. They made it so that there are certain criteria that you have to have to be able to get the RBT. They put all that into one training, but they put all the stuff for the BCAT in the training too. So you could go through and get the training for both of them in the same 40 hour class, which I super duper love. Now they have different requirements after the class. It's not just about doing the class. You have to take tests. And then uh, for each uh, designation, there's a different criteria of working with individuals, having supervision, um, and you have to do that to actually, so I am not a BCAT or an RBT because I didn't do the rest of it, but I passed the tests. So I, I, I'm always like, Ooh, look at me. Cause I, I was able to pass the test. Uh, but I did not do all the other things uh, in order to be a BCAT, but I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. Right. Uh, anyway, so there's that. And somebody wrote in and asked a question and I want to get back to it here in the chat. They asked, are RBT and, um, are, is skills and IBT the same? I wanna take the RBT and parent course, but it's expensive. So um, skills and RBT are not the same, but in the beginning, there were, they were just one product. In the beginning, there was just skills and there was the component of it that was the assessment. There was the component of it that was dealing with challenging behavior. There was the component that was the curriculum. And then there was the component of training somebody of how to do it. And everybody agreed that shopping mall was too big. So they split them up and there was skills and there was IBT. So skills is what you teach and IBT is how you teach it. Um, they are now still separate entities, but they are being run by the same team. And that's relatively new. So if you know, if you call the skills people, they're sitting across the table from the IBT people. Um, so that's interesting. Um, uh, now, as for it being expensive, apply for a grant uh, because that's money well spent too. And you can apply for a grant through Act Today and say, you know, I, I want to, I want the paired training. Now, if you're at Card, um, you can get all that training skills and and the IBT stuff is free to card parents. And I apologize to people who aren't card parents. Uh, there is a cost for them, but there are grants to help you. Skills, uh, somebody asked, what is skills? Skills is an online tool uh, specifically for teaching someone who has um, delays in different areas. First, there's an assessment that uh, that you take as a parent and they've done studies to show that a parent can uh, appropriately take the test and it's accurate as if they had, you know, a professional sitting with them. And um, then it, then once you take the assessment, it shows you where the child is and it shows you curricula in eight different areas and says, you know, here's what this child, uh, here are lessons that would be advantageous for this child at this age, at this level of development to help them to get caught up. Um, and it gives teaching tips too, but it doesn't teach you how to use it. If you want to know how um, to be an effective teacher of those things, you would go and take the classes at IBT. So yeah, card families can absolutely get discounted access. You have skills for free. Um, and if you write to me, I will make sure that you get whatever you need at IBT. Write to me at s.penrod at autism-life.com. I can only do that for card parents. And um, yeah, um, and, and I have to pull some strings, but I will pull them strings for you. Uh, all right, don't tell anybody. It's a secret between us. All right, uh, okay. Uh, we always have, we just did our jargon. We always have a question of the day for you. 
So going to our question, who makes you laugh? That's funny because I was just saying that uh, we watched the Hannah Gadsby thing last night and she makes me laugh. Oh my goodness, she makes me laugh. Um, but there's a lot of people I love. I love stand up and I love to watch comedians. You know, I used to be a stand up comedian. Uh, we watched Patton Oswald the other day and I had the opportunity once to open for Pat, Patton Oswald and I find him hilariously funny. Um, but I, you know, I, I have to say, if, I like all different kinds of stand up comedians. They make me laugh. Ray Romano makes me weep. I laugh so hard. But who makes you laugh? It's important to tune into those things. Can I tell you that in the early days, of autism when my husband and I were just like, we did not have it together and we were in the grief part, which I think is an important part of it. Not trying to make light of that at all, uh, but it's not the fun part. Let's just be honest, right? And we are people who love to watch television, uh, just who we are. And um, we had, uh, I don't know whether it was a box set or what it was, but we, or whether we recorded it, but it was uh, a whole series of Triumph the Insult Dog. And I don't know why, but it was, we watched it almost every day. And we would just laugh and laugh and laugh. And it was the thing that kept us remotely sane. And it was a way for us to connect. And sometimes, like, I, you see me got, we cry all the time on the show, but those are happy tears, right? When I'm upset about something, it's very hard for me to access the tears. Like I just don't give myself permission to cry. But if you get me laughing, then it's like I can't turn off the faucets and then the tears can come. And sometimes, man, you just need that, right? So I think a, a really good belly laugh is super duper important. I find it ironic that, you know, for probably two years, we watched Triumph the Insult Dog every single day, my husband and I, and laughed. And if something was going, you know, there's a whole thing, it's a puppet, you know? And, and there's a whole thing that the, the puppet is rude and he's just horrible to people. And, and I guess maybe, you know, it was that we felt like being rude to people. So it was funny to us. And then the dog's answer for everything is, you know, for me to poop on. So it says, you know, uh, you know, your hair looks, you know, the, the dog, the puppet says, your hair looks lovely. And then there's a pause and he goes, for me to poop on. I mean, the most sophomoric humor, but we would laugh and laugh and laugh until we would cry. And then of course, years later, it's all interrelated. I realized that the voice of the dog is Robert Smigel, who is a very, very funny man. And that he's a part of our community. He has two kids on the spectrum. And, and like, when I realized that I was like, oh, there's something about, there's nothing in his humor. There's nothing in Triumph the Insult Dog that would tell you that it was about autism, but there was just something in my DNA that connected and my husband's DNA that connected and, and it, it was what we needed. Um, so big shout out to Robert Smigel. Who makes you laugh though? Uh, share who makes you laugh and, and let's talk about that. Everybody needs a little laugh, especially right now. Don't we need it? Okay, we always have a topic of the week. And for those of you who remember from day before yesterday or Monday, I love this topic this week. Never take a no from someone who wasn't authorized to give you a yes. Um, and I just think that should be crocheted on a pillow or put on a frame in, on a wall in a hallway that you walk by every day. And especially if you are a member of the autism community, that core autism community or that larger autism community to people who care about folks on the spectrum, you are going to need this t-shirt because people are going to tell you no, that weren't authorized to tell you yes. And if you stop there, you're not going to get where you want to get to. You're going to have to steal yourself and, you know, you call whatever number you need to call for whatever thing that you need to call. I don't care whether it's for your ordering lunch or you're trying to get an ABA provider, but you've got to realize that the person who's answering the phone is not authorized to give you a yes. Um, that's why they're answering the phone. Those are great jobs. They're great people. I'm not trying to be little, but let's be honest. They aren't authorized to give you a yes. So don't take a no from those people. You've got to move up the food chain and you've got to say, hey, can I speak to a supervisor? Can I speak to a manager? 
Um, can I speak to somebody who has some expertise on that? And if the person on the phone is worth their salt, they're going to make it hard for you to get past them. They're the gatekeeper, but you've got to work it. You've got to get past them. You've got to be nice. I'm all about being nice. I don't think that yelling ever got anybody anything they really wanted, right? Um, there's lots of ways to massage a situation, but the main thing is you don't ever take a no from someone who wasn't authorized to give you a yes. That's from Maya Angelou to Oprah to me to you. Never take a no from somebody who wasn't authorized to give you a yes. So today on the show, we have the amazing Bonnie Yates, who I think is uh, hopefully already joining us. And because uh, I'm really late, she's been waiting. I, I talked way too long. Is she with us, Traven? Dum, 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 dum. No, she's not with us. All right, so let me text her and see if she is joining us. Um, but uh, you guys can also be writing in in the interim, and Bonnie might have gotten gotten held up at an IEP because she it is still IEP season. Yes. Um, hold on, as we know, I can't type and do anything at the same time. Um, oh. Is that her? No, nope. I don't know what's happening. Uh, and Traven, if you have the opportunity, if you can resend her to the link, because she may not realize uh, that she already has the link, uh, but go ahead and, and do that. So these are the places where you guys can connect uh, with us and ask your questions. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, we're going to give her a minute here and I'm going to go ahead and, and read the question that I'm not qualified to answer, but I have another question that will help me so that when I have somebody qualified to ask it, the question that came in yesterday was a general question. I'm working with a high functioning client who is really doing well with contrived situations, uh, yet has much difficulty applying the information in real life situations. We keep providing different scenarios and role-playing various situations, and we do see an increase in generalized skills with the more scenarios and situations being role-played. Being that she is reaching 100% on her graphs with the contrived scenarios, how do I continue working on these skills in the contrived setting yet, uh, if it seems as though she has mastered the skill? For example, she has much uh, difficulty perspective taking and engaging in appropriate expected behavior in social settings. For example, during the last session, she stuck her hand into a peanut butter and started a jar and started eating out of it. In a contrived setting, she would be able to tap that it is inappropriate behavior in a public setting. Okay, so here's my question for you. Um, is that you said that when you continue to work on things um, where you're role playing, that she then uh, you are seeing the, the general. It is working. It's just working slowly. Is what I think I'm reading into this. That she is able to generalize some of it some of the time, but the problem is, is your mastery criteria is what I'm hearing. So your mastery criteria says that she is getting the the thing at 100. percent And this is one of the things that we talk about on the show is what is mastery. And how do you set mastery criteria? And I always say it's very important to remember, don't let the tail wag the dog. So in the beginning, before you start doing a lesson, you come up with a plan for how to generalize. And this is for the parents, not for you, because an expert needs to answer your question. But um, you, you come up with a plan for generalization. So the plan in the beginning is we're going to teach this and then we're going to role play it. And then we're going to see if she's able to do it in the real life situation. And to some extent, the more you role play, the more she's able to do it in the, the situation. Um, so the issue here isn't that it isn't working. You might want to tweak a couple of things and ask yourself in which situations, what helps her to generalize, like what, when you're, when it is working, what's working about it? I think Bonnie's here. Um, so, uh, but my question is, is it just the mastery criteria criteria that's wrong? If what we're trying to do is get to it being in the real life situation, and she's only doing that 10% of the time, just change your mastery criteria to it being it has to generalize. I think 
you know, but an expert needs to answer your question. Um, uh, who can I connect with to get access to IBT? I'm a card mom. Uh, just write to me, s.penrod at autism-live.com, and I will connect you. There's Bonnie. Sort of. <laughs> Are you able to be with us now? Because if you're not, just say no, so. No, I, we'll I am able. I am able. I just, okay. uh, I didn't know what to do to get hold of you. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. Uh, uh, so, uh, and what you always have a different background, a different oh, backdrop. Well, this, is, this is supposed to be for your entertainment. This is this, uh, oh, shit. this is this back, uh, this, this is a little deck that we had off of our bedroom and we never, ever, ever, ever used it. And then my husband put a table out here, which was great, but then it was really sunny. So then he ordered these weird bamboo curtains, which give me shade during the, the day. So it's an I indoor love it. It's an indoor outdoor thing. Yeah. I love it. Just so we don't be on top of each other, you know. That's well, it's very important. I know yeah. we're trying to find little nicks and nooks and crannies where people can be here so that we have it's important that we have time to ourselves. I like your little I like your little chop that you did. Uh yeah, and, and it really is me that did it. It's a little on the crazy side, good. but um I have hats when I can't stand it anymore so that I can, you know, I can, I can be all jaunty. You've got a great uh, face and great hair. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you said to my husband, uh, it's very interesting what people say when you cut your hair off that uh, a viewer wrote in yesterday and said, you know, there are not many people who could pull that off, but I think that you are. But you totally are. But you know, I was, I was like getting ready for you to come on and have your head shaved. Well, uh, you know, well, I, I mean, it's pretty I, I close. Got it it's pretty close, and I, it still could happen because this is my OCD out for a walk. No trichotillomania, please. <laughs> no, I'm not pulling it out. There's no pulling it out. It's just, um, it's you know, I there are so few things I can control right now, and my hair is one of them that I cannot control because there's my hair is curly, so I, I just love keep your hair. I've well, been anyway. getting, I have a friend that's really lovely. Um, she's a school district attorney in Northern California. We've been exchanging emails this morning because she made donuts over the weekend. And today okay. I wrote her and I was like, how many do I get today? You know, <laughs> we're so burned out. I'm, I'm so burned out this week. Just oh, because like, it's out. like IEP craziness right now, right? Yeah, and I've got a case that's going to hearing on Monday. So. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, I, look, it is so sweet of you to be here. Uh, my assumption is we will not have you on Monday then. Uh, let me look at that and email you. If you're going to hearing, I, like, I would rather you focus on it, that. But... Well, no, it may settle. Oh, 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 well, there we have. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I didn't hear that. Uh, okay. Uh, do we, uh, let's start with, this is Bonnie Yates. She's a special education attorney working with the Tolner Law Offices, and she is amazing. And she joins us to talk about your rights on a regular basis. And Bonnie, tell us about Tolner Law Offices and give us the disclaimer. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Tolner Law Offices is an aid attorney firm with, um, locations in San Jose, El Segundo, and Irvine, and we do special education and disability discrimination and a few million other things, and um, we're happy to be here this morning to talk to you during school closure about your rights. Anything we say on this program is basically being said from the vantage point of working in California and under California law. And if you need an attorney in another state, we refer you to COPA, C-O-P-A-A dot net. Um, if you are in California and you want a consultation with us, we do that on a complimentary basis. And you can go to our website, uh, fill in the paperwork and we'll get back to you with the time to talk. Um, we are giving lots of general advice these days, particularly in light of the rule changes since school closure. But I'm really finding that I'm also getting very specific questions from people. And if you do have a specific question, it really, this isn't really a substitute for that. Also, I just heard about this cool thing called Air Tutor. Mm -hmm. that somebody, do you know about Air Tutor? No. It's supposedly like the most optimal online virtual education platform and I just heard about it from another attorney today people may want to check it out it's supposed to be great for kids who 
are going to have to do this online learning for a while. I haven't researched it yet, but. Okay, Air Tutor, though. We'll yeah, look into AIR it. Tutor. Yeah. All right. I, yeah. I, I'll bet they're going to be a guest on this show next week. You know, that would be guess. very cool. That's, uh, I've made a note. Okay. Um, so Bonnie, we had some questions that were left over. Do we want to launch into those or do we, we do. have something you want? Okay. So the first question that we had was, can we ask to have our kid repeat their grade in light of all this stuff I'm presuming? In our case, our son is in 11th grade. It, you know, that's a hard one because you're kind of, um, you know, right up against uh, graduating the next year. You didn't say if your son was on a high school diploma track or whether he's gonna get a certificate of completion, but it, it really sounds as if you're thinking he's gonna graduate in the 12th grade year. Um, I have had some discussions with districts about retention recently, which surprised me because retention's a dirty word. I think rather than retention for the 11th grade, I think the question should be, are you going to have sufficient credits to val to um, graduate from high school by the end of next year? Do you feel like if you have been given credit in certain subjects, that's a realistic reflection of what your student actually knows and can do? Or, I, I mean, I think you do. See, this is a problem with my little curtain setup. Um, <laughs> I think you do need to have an IEP meeting ASAP to discuss these issues and I wouldn't be talking about retention I'd be saying delay graduation to make sure that that the person has enough time to do credit recovery we talked about graduation recently on the show and I mentioned that the problem you run into is you if you get like too close to your 12th grade graduation date you can't file for due process and invoke stay put. And if you actually do graduate, it's very unlikely that you're gonna be able to get into due process after the fact and get compensatory education. So now is the time to talk about this. The trouble with graduation in California is they got rid of the high school exit exam and they basically now say that the particular school district just has to offer equivalent courses that meet you know the academic requirements for the state of California and they don't like look under the sheets so much by which I mean if you got a C in expository language or I don't know what the language arts class would be they don't say well you pass this class but when we test your reading you're reading on a fourth grade level they just say you pass the class so those challenges are difficult because of that, and you're, if you are gonna try to retain the student for an extra year or two or whatever it's gonna be, you're definitely gonna need an outside evaluation to show that the student can't possibly be passing some of these classes that he's supposedly passing given his skill level. So there's, it, it can be done. There's a workup required um, and you gotta start it now, which is good. You got like some months to work this out. I'm glad you're not in 12th grade or your, yeah. your students not in 12th grade. Absolutely, thank you for all that. Uh, the next question, can we ARD for ABA therapy for half the day or something like that? And they don't specify how old the kiddo is. No, they don't, they don't. No. Well, I think, I think uh, for the listeners that are in states other than Texas, you can request anything you want. That's always the case but is it gonna work or not? Are you talking about a preschooler? Are you talking about somebody that's less than six years old? Are you talking about somebody that's in elementary school? Um, I really need to know those facts. So if you'll write back in and provide more details, we can answer the question because it is a good one and it does come up, the question of dual enrollment. And for those of you who are scratching your head, they, they call the IEP meeting the ARD meeting in Texas. So. It's like assignment review and something. Yeah, well. Don't mess with it's, that. It's, I always think of an aardvark. I don't know why. Uh, it's just where my head goes. Uh, okay, next question. Is the distance learning plan uh, as per IDEA for all the 50 states? My understanding is that if your state is giving services to regular ed children, you have to give services to special ed children. Whether your state does it in the way we do in California, I don't know. California is not doing it uniformly. 
But the general concept, whether it's called a distance learning plan or whether it's called an aardvark, um, you <laughs> are supposed to have, uh, it, the first question is, if you, is your district providing education to regular ed students? If so, it's discriminatory not to provide it to special ed students. So, you know, you should be able to go on to their website, district website, and get some information about what they are and aren't doing. But again, if they're providing education to general ed students, they have to provide some kind of equivalent opportunity for special ed students. Um, and I'm assuming that they're doing it virtually because of health, health concerns. So yeah. Okay. And so it's weird because it's at the end of the school year, but is it, can we assume that for every kid who has an IEP that there should be a distance learning plan being discussed right now? Well, they should be, whether, I don't care what you call it. Um, they should be trying to the best of their abilities to implement the IEP. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you can call it a modified IEP. You can call it a school closure IEP. But the point is they're supposed to be doing something and you might want to get back to us with what they're doing for the regular ed students. It seems like it's very state by state. So like in California, we have Senate Bill 117, which seems to be governing what the districts do and don't have to do for special ed. So that's interesting to look at if you are in California. When the federal government got done with all of this, really the only stuff that California was allowed to have waivers on were the timelines for producing records and doing assessments. Um, so everything else is supposed to be in place and you're, they're supposed to be implementing the IEP as, as closely as they reasonably can. But since they aren't giving correspondence to the IEP in the sense of there's no school placement, there's no face-to-face -face related services, they're writing up some other plan to show you what you are gonna get. And if your question is, is it gonna be unwise for me to go through this time period without a written plan? The answer to that is yes, for several reasons, including present accountability, but also if you wanna make future claims for comp ed, you're gonna be able to, you're gonna to need to be able to show what was done versus yeah. what should have been done. Well, just on a basic level, it's that whole thing, I always mess this phrase up, but it's that whole thing you either, uh, fail, you, if you plan, oh, you, you fail to plan, you plan to fail. That's the thing. Okay. So uh, we don't want to plan to fail. So let's, let's have a plan. plan. Absolutely. Now we mentioned before it's IEP season and you've been going to your fair share of IEPs, Bonnie, and they want to know, do you have any tips for parents? We've, you know, we've worked for years to get better at what it's like sitting at the table with everybody, but now it's virtual. Do you have any tips for parents for virtual IEPs? Um, well, I do. I haven't really thought about the problem of having children at home while you're trying to do this virtual IEP. My general rule is I don't like children to be the subject of a meeting that's going on where they're hearing people talk about their unique needs. Yeah. So I'd say question number one is how are you going to do this in a time, place, and manner so that you have privacy? There's actually a very funny um, ABC newscaster who's got this great program called 10% Happier about meditation. He like decided to like spin off into that. So they were asking him like last week, where are you recording from? And he said, my wife's closet. So, <laughs> you know, if that's good enough for ABC News, right? Um, it might be good enough for you. Um, I like the Rev app, app REV on my smartphone that's really easy to record on you can email the meeting contents you can get them transcribed if you need to so download the rev app on your phone and give them uh 24 hours written notice that you intend to record the meeting let's see what else i mean i'm not the best illustration of this but like if there's anything personal on the walls in your room or stuff that you think is inappropriate by which I really mean, you know, personal. I don't mean like, you know, obscene or something. But just think about what people are going to see when they watch you in the meeting. Uh, 
today is not a very good example because I'm officially allowing myself to be burned out today, but I do try to suit up and show up for meetings. I think you'll feel like I've had some funny exchanges with prospective clients where I'm like, let's do this on, you know, as a Zoom meeting. And they're like, no, we'll have to brush our hair. I'm like, well, you don't have to brush your hair for me. But I, I do think it conveys a certain degree of seriousness if you're if you're going to meet with these people to show them that you um, are organized. Uh, they tend to be projecting the documents on the screen of your computer, which makes it hard then for you to see the, the participants. Um, I like to ask for the documents, like the draft IEP documents, the progress report and the goals a few days in advance, and I print them out because I just don't really always do that well with, with the, the screen. Um, well, here's a fun thing. If you need, if your meeting's three hours long and you drink water during these meetings the way I do, because I, I find that my throat gets dry and you need to take a break um, an hour and a half into it, you just say, hey, listen, I need to just step away for a minute. I'll be right back. You know, I need a health break. Let's turn off the recorders. And then the beauty of the thing is I don't have to have some teacher walk me all the way around the school and get the key and open the bathroom. It's like, you know, I have my own plumbing, which is nice and you'll have that too. I like to have water. Um, I like to have, you know, note paper and um, pens and things like that. And it's your meeting. Uh, so, you know, it, if you can't, if, if people are freezing constantly and you're not able to hear them talking, that's not gonna be good for your recording, but it's also not gonna be good for you. So at the beginning of the meeting, I'd spell out like, what's the protocol for what, if we have technical problems? I always ask at the beginning of the meeting, are there time constraints? And, mm -hmm. and, and if there are gonna be time constraints, who are we gonna lose? And should we put those people on first? Um, for students that are in private school, it's very important to get the participation of the private school in the IEP meeting, provided you've talked to those people first and you know what they're going to say so that they don't say the wrong stuff. So um, I'd make sure for your home IEP meeting that you get their buy-in so they can participate in the meeting as well. Um, it's actually been easier to schedule meetings with everybody at home because it, the fact that we're not moving from point A to point B to point C, like district administrators this time of year, they might have three IEP meetings in a day and one might be in the high school over here and another might be at this middle school two miles away. So it's actually been easier to schedule meetings. But, you know, I just want to say if you've got a distance learning plan and you haven't had an IEP meeting to talk what's going to happen in the fall and what's going to happen for the foreseeable future. I'm really worried about that and I really want you to request an IP meeting like right now because otherwise I'm I'm really worried about where you're going to be at in September. So and and schools are winding down and closing now for the summer like request that meeting this mil millisecond. I agree with you, Bonnie. Um, they want to know, how do you speak to the no aid issue? It's on the IEP, but it wasn't delivered. And for and, and a lot of people are in this boat right now. It wasn't delivered because they were at home and the school didn't send them at home. What do they do? Uh, well, there are exceptions where you can be um, required to provide services in the home. I'll send you a little blurb about that. As far as the aid issue, what would the aid have done at home that you couldn't do, would be my question. You're, hate to say it, but you're the teacher and the aid. If you, if you in fulfilling your role as teacher or aid need more training, LRP, which is the, you know, school district attorney legal clearinghouse has put out stuff that said, consider parent training for parents can, you know, uh, in whatever areas they need the help, assistive technology or anything else, consider counseling for parents. Um, it, it, it may be possible, it may start to be being more possible in the future to have people come in into the home, but there are all kinds of health concerns that the districts realistically are dealing with on behalf of their employees and your child. It's kind of on a case by case basis. Um, but if you can articulate what you lost during this time period, once school reopens, you can probably ask for some compensatory services. The thing is, if your child was able to make progress without the 
When you say aid, I'm assuming you mean paraprofessional and not behavioral therapist. If it's a behavioral <laughs> therapist, my answer would be I'm more concerned because I think that's more of a loss. But if your child's been able to be within the range of instruction and get passing grades during COVID anyway, without the one-to-one -one aid, you're probably not gonna get comp ed for the time period. But I will send in the language um, that, that discusses what the standard is. I just don't have it at the tip of my tongue today. But, um, but I have some, so many questions though, Bonnie. That's I have so, I have so many questions. Some, some families are definitely getting people coming into the home and providing face-to-face -face services. So it's not impossible. Okay, but if you don't, if you're in a district where your kid was going to school, they had a one-on-one -on -one aid, now they're at home, they're, you know, the teacher is giving whatever form of instruction they're giving, and the expectation is that now suddenly your child is supposed to be able to do it without an aid. They couldn't do it in the classroom with, you know, without an aid, and now there's, because they're magically at home, and well, for you some- Well, the, 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 the listener didn't say they couldn't do it in the classroom. Well, but I would assume if the school is paying for an aid, I would assume that the aid was necessary. And that might oh, be yeah, a lot absolutely. of assumption. But, but what, what I'm saying is that like, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but as a parent, if the parent worked and now they're being told, well, we can't send, our hands are tied. We can't send an aid to go work with your child. Your child can't access the curriculum without an aid but it's now up to you. I love the parent who goes, okay, I'll do it. Um, but they are entitled to training, which is great. We didn't know that going into this, but there are many parents who either can't or won't. Maybe they have to work in order to keep the roof over the head. Um, I would think that, um, that they would be entitled to compensatory because they couldn't access the curriculum because there wasn't somebody there to help them to access the curriculum. Um, that might be possible. And if that's the situation, you should be having an IEP right now. You shouldn't be waiting. I wasn't clear in the hypothetical example, but you know, whether the parent I'm, I'm operating under the assumption that the parent was available, which isn't fair, but there's a lot of stuff right about right now that kind of sucks in California. Parents are doing a double shift. They're doing, yeah. they're oh doing, man. You no. Know, and here's, here's the other concern I have is that you know, here in California, or at least in our school district, what they've said is that basically the classes are now akin to being pass fail. If the kid is showing that they put in effort, then it's, you know, that they passed and they're going to get an A. Um, if the kid doesn't show up for class and doesn't put forth any effort, then it's a fail. But if you showed up and even attempted that it's a pass. So all of a sudden, all these kids are going to get an A for being at home with the parent. I'm afraid it's going to come back in the fall and go, see, they were able to get an A without an A. They don't need it in the classroom. Well, that's, be what, that's why if you sign your distance learning plan, you have to make sure that you say it's temporary. I haven't really seen districts trying to pull that yet, and hopefully they won't. Hopefully. But, um, but I circulated a form a couple of weeks ago that was a documentation form that yes. you guys can use. I think the 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 pass fail or the A grade or whatever isn't going to trump a, a good record of being able to show what your child actually was doing, and you know um, some uh, well timed camera phone videos of your child's difficulty in in learning would be good things to, to store and share with your IP meeting team. Um, okay, so document, be documenting. Well, document, document, film, document, you know, yeah. I've film your kiddo trying to access the curriculum with the distance learning. And you don't have to show the video if you choose not to, but film it on several occasions so that you have it if you need to. I mean, one of the things that's really clear in the law is if you if your child can't do this using existing technology, you're entitled to different additional technology and that's where stuff like air tutor can maybe be helpful there we go um, uh, we are at the end of the hour bonnie it goes so fast when you're here because i'm so engaged but um thank I'll you so the, much send you the verbiage okay and then let us know if you're with, joining us on monday how that looks i will do that all right thank you uh, thank you so much have a good Take weekend care.
You too. Bye-bye. Bye. I just have a, a minute here and I want to address because a couple of people wrote in a couple of questions. Uh, somebody said, I'm stimming a lot more. Is this normal? Uh, we are in lockdown. Are the noises part of autism in an adult or anxiety? And I got to be honest that I think it's different for different people, but yes, we are all experiencing more anxiety. Look at my hair. Um, and it shows up in interesting ways. Some people are eating more. Some people are exercising more because it's stress and they need it. Um, we do things to comfort ourselves. It's just, it's just a fact of life. And so, sometimes we do things that are productive and sometimes we do things that are not productive. And it doesn't matter unless the non-productive thing is preventing us from doing something else or causing harm. So, you know, for the executive who clicks his pen when he's nervous or thinking about something, it's not hurting anybody. But if it's driving other people crazy and making them so that they can't concentrate, then I don't. There, maybe there's a cost for it. But um, you know, my understanding is that making noises is considered an automatic reinforcing behavior. And there's something about it that it's a paycheck for you. Maybe it helps to center you. Um, maybe, you know, it helps to calm you. Maybe it helps you to focus. And if it's not harming you or anybody around you, I don't think I would worry about it overly much right now. The fact that you're aware of it is a really good sign. Um, and, and, you know, maybe if, when it's happening, if you stop and ask yourself, what, why am I, why am I doing that? What am I feeling right now? Just to have even more awareness on it. But I'm, I'm not surprised at all. I think all of us, whatever our STEM is, and everybody has STEMs on the spectrum, not on the spectrum, everybody has STEMs. Um, we're doing more of them right now. We just are. Um, so bless your heart. I think, I think you're doing a great job. And then I want to be clear. Somebody wrote in and said, I'm confused now is IBT $7 a month or is it skills? Nothing is $7 a month for, um, skills. The membership is like 70, 70. And I think it's like $75 a month, but then you get the 10% off. Uh, if you say that you called from autism live, uh, IBT you pay for individual trainings. And some of those are just $7 and you, for, to, to have the video for a month or two months. Uh, if you wanna keep it longer, you can keep it longer. Uh, it's like renting a video sort of, uh, sort of thing. And different videos have different costs. If you wanted to do the entire of the RBT BCAT training on IBT, the cost would be around $440 for the entire thing. Um, across the whatever time period that you did it. And keep in mind, if you're doing the RBT or the BCAT, there is a time limit. I think for RBT, you have to complete the training within 90 days. It's 40 hours of training. So you can get it done in a week. Um, but a lot of people break it up over more than that. And I already got the email from the parent about IBT. So I've got that. Uh, and somebody said, I saw the new Patton Oswalt. My 18 year old autistic son loves him and had us watch him. We watch a lot of comedy, best medicine, great way to cope with stress. I agree. We like AFB and I love uh, America's Funniest Home Videos. It's a great thing to watch with our kiddos. Great thing to turn the sound down and say, what do you think they're feeling with the sound off, right? Uh, we love it so much that we have had Vin DeBona, the producer, on the show. I talked about how many kids with autism and teens with autism love AFB and how they learn so much. And of course, Tom Bergeron has been on the show as well. Uh, they also love SNL, The Office, Friends, and News Bloopers. Oh, those are funny, right? Uh, we went through many phases with my son. I, he, right now, he loves Conan O'Brien and he loves um, John Oliver uh, this week, uh, tonight. And, uh, but for, for a while, all we ever watched were goats screaming to songs. Google it, uh, goats screaming to songs, you will lose the next day laughing. Uh, and somebody else says you rock that hair seriously. My mother-in-law cuts her hair when she is stressed. This is me, this is me. Uh, so anyway, they say they love the color, that's wonderful. Okay, you guys, uh, tomorrow on the show, licensed marriage and family therapist Vince Redmond is joining Nancy and I for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. It's going to be great. If you have questions for him, you can go ahead and write those in now. Thank you so much for being here. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.
The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and today on Friday, we do Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. And Nancy Allspa Jackson is not able to be with me this morning. She um, has something that she needs to do with her son, Wyatt. And uh, we want to give a big shout out to Wyatt, who graduated from high school this week, which is absolutely amazing. And I got a lot uh, that we want to talk about here on the show today, and we're going to have guest licensed and marriage and family therapist, Vince Redmond, a little bit later on in the show. And trust me, we're going to need him. Uh, Because I got a lot I want to talk about. But um, first and foremost, I want to say that if you are a a praying kind of person and you watch this show, then you know and love Joanne Lara. And I'm going to just, I'm not at liberty to say a whole lot. So I'm just going to say that she needs your prayers today. So if you are that praying kind of people, just say, uh, say a word for Joanne this morning. And she will be ticked at me for having said that to you. And I'm with love, Joanne, go ahead, be ticked at me. I hope you call me up and yell at me. That would make my freaking day. Um, Cause I love you. So, so um, man, a lot has gone on this week. And let me just say that we are a world and especially a nation that is struggling And everybody is having a lot of emotions right now. And it seemed to me last night that there was like the scales had tipped a little bit and it went to pure anger. There's a lot of anger going on in the world right now. And I'm a firm believer that where there is anger, there is fear below. Um, That at the very bottom of all anger is fear, 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 fear. And I was, I was seeing anger sprouting up everywhere yesterday, including in myself. I'm angry. Every, we should be. Everybody should be angry right now. God knows there's enough to be angry about, right? Um, and um, But I think it's worthwhile to step back and go, okay, I can't control what's happening, but I can ask myself, what am I angry about and what is the fear beneath that? And I'm going to ask everybody within the reach of this show for a moment to ask yourself, what are you angry about and what is the fear beneath? And I can't take everything that's going on and I can't take on all of it in the news because, man, it's, it's you know, bigger than I can get my head around, right? Um, but I, it was in our um, lineup for us to talk about two very specific stories this morning on Autism Live. And I found myself not even waiting until this morning. I posted something on Facebook last night, something that I, I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't hold back. And, you know, I try to show a great deal of restraint on Facebook because I believe at the bottom of everything, everybody gets to have an opinion and everybody's feelings are valid. And to say anything else is just crazy town, right? But I want us to make sure that we're feeling what we're feeling because it, you know, because it's what we're feeling and not that it's masking a fear that we're doing. So what am I talking about? There were two stories in the news this week, horrible, horrible stories. One, uh, and if you watch the show, you know that I believe that people do things for attention. And so I don't like to say people's names. I know when Nancy is here and we're doing a news story, I won't say the name and Nancy will read the name. And I'm like, don't say their name. You're giving them attention. So I'm not going to say people's names. I'm going to refer to them as mom one, who is the psycho mom. And then I'm going to refer to them as mom two, who is the YouTuber mom. Okay. And one of the things that I hate the most right now is false equivalency. 
Uh, a lot of you are mad at both of these moms and God knows like you are entitled to all of the emotions that you have, right? I'm not trying to say, don't feel what you're feeling, but let's be productive about this. So we have mom one psycho mom who I don't know what her deal is. Um, I seriously don't, but it scares me to death. And, and I like to be afraid. And so it brings up me in me and an anger and a rage on behalf of our kids and individuals who are on the autism spectrum, because I want to protect them from people like her. I seriously don't know what her deranged deal is, but she's deranged. And how do I know that she's deranged? Because I, like, you know, I watched the video of her pushing her child in the canal and then running away. Um, and I, you know, I'm able to see the look on her face and to know that two minutes later she ran and got help for him. They came back and helped him out of the water. And then an hour later she took him and drowned him, uh, you know, did the deal again, managed to be successful that time and then ran to the police and said that two black men had stopped her car and asked her for drugs and took her child. And she asked for help from people in the autism community to help her child who was missing. She's deranged. That is psycho mom. I don't, like, she, like I said, she scares me. And all I have wished this week is that somebody could have found her or that kid before and been able to say, are you not able to do this? Let me take it. If you can't do this, somebody else can. Don't do this. You got something going on, Cookie, that I don't know if it can be fixed, but for sure, it's not our top priority. Our top priority is getting your kids safe and out of your deranged clutches. Like how many hours did I spend this week thinking, man, I hope that if there are people who feel this way, they will step forward and they will go, I can't do this. I cannot do this. And listen, we're not saying that that's an easy thing to do, right? But anything, I would, I like, I, I, when things like that happen, I want to be able to have a rewind button, rewind and go get that kit. Am I alone here? I think a lot of you feel this way and felt this way too. So along comes story number two with mom number two, YouTuber mom. And we hear that she has put out a statement that she has rehomed her four-year-old that she adopted from China. And man, the wall of anger. And listen, I get it, have your feelings, totally have your feelings, but look at what the fear is. What is the fear underneath that? Because I guarantee you there's some fear under there. And I have fear. I have fear um, because a lot of time now, I talk to moms that whose kids are at different stages on the spectrum who are realizing that they have come to an impasse where they are no longer able to serve their child. And it's for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's because the parent has developed an illness and they physically can't do it, right? Other times it's because the parent is so emotionally drained that they don't, they can't they're not able to do it anymore. And sometimes it's just that the kid is so big that they can't, they're not able to do it anymore. Sometimes it's that the routines are so ingrained that they can't change it, right? But the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes it's better for a child to not be with their parents. And this crosses every single line there is. It isn't just about autism, but it's prevalent in autism. And by the way, I have come to see, because of my wonderful friend, Joanne Laura, who again, needs your prayers today, that it is the natural course of things for eventually when kids are older to not live with their parents. That it should never be a thing that a, that a child stays with their parents forever. And I'll tell you why, because this is where we really get into the fear, folks. We are all afraid of what happens when we're not what happens when we're not here to take care of our kids and who will be there? And will that be someone who's responsible? Or will that be somebody who rehomes them, right? Isn't that part of it? You know, if we are afraid of who takes care of our kids when we are not here, I deal with on a daily basis, parents who have teens, young adults and middle-aged adults who say, I'm stuck. 
I feel like I'm only a good parent if I sit, I can see that they would do better if they were someplace else, but I feel like I wouldn't be a good parent if I placed them in a, in a, a group home, if I put them in their own apartment, I would feel like I was giving up. And they struggle with those feelings of guilt. But we've seen, folks, that the reality is that that parent eventually dies or goes in the hospital, and then it's this wham, bam, we have to do it quickly, and it's really hard on the individual. Now, I'm not trying to create a false equivalency. This was a four-year-old little boy. But even four-year-olds, there are some parents who are not equipped. And I get it. Part of your anger is that you feel like she capitalized on her children. She monetized them. She got sponsors. I got to be honest with you guys that as a person who made a decision many years ago, I, I tell you guys all the time that I was on the floor praying and said, please help me to help my child. And if you help me to help my child, I will do what you show me to do. And I will turn around and help whoever I can. And that has been a jagged little pill, right? Because I want to be there to help parents, but it has also meant giving up a piece of our privacy and a piece of my son's privacy, which I don't take lightly. And when my son was old enough, we started having conversations all the time about, is it okay to talk about this? Is it not okay to talk about this? And there's lots of stuff I don't talk about to preserve his privacy. Um, there are things that I tell you guys about and there are things that I don't. Um, and when you are a person, when you make a decision to be in the public eye and people do it for different reasons. Uh, I don't know what her motives were. I know that she was somebody who was trying to be a YouTuber and not being very successful. And then she went through an international adoption and saw that she gained a lot of viewers and she got a lot of sponsorship from it. Uh, I know that, you know, there was a moment when they weren't looking to adopt a special needs child, but like a lot of people who go through international adoption, they are given classes about the fact that the reality is you probably are adopting a child who's special needs and you better get used to it. But you know what? You can explain that to somebody till the cows come home and the reality of it is different. And, you know, she tried. She wasn't up to it. Her family wasn't up to it. I don't know why. But I can guarantee you that it was not an easy decision to decide to let him go to somebody else and to go permanently. I don't, I can't imagine doing that. I really cannot. But I watch parents struggle every single day with being able to say, this is where I'm no longer effective for this child. And my fear is that this backlash and making this woman, you know, who had lots of other things going on, that those parents are now going to feel like, see, you're a bad parent if you let your child go live with somebody else and let them pick up the care of your child, custodial care of your child. And I'm so afraid because there are parents out there who need help. And we see what happens when they don't get help. It's not just the woman who pushed her child in the canal. There have been people who have been hurting children. And we have got to stop acting like it's all hearts and flowers and roses, right? This is tough. And we know, first and foremost, we in the autism community know this is not an easy haul. It's not for everybody. I know some of you are out there are heroes and that you are getting it done every day. And this is unconscionable to you that she had her four-year-old place because there's so much that can be done at four. But you know what? She couldn't do it. I'm so grateful that kid's alive. I'm so grateful that whatever that woman had going on, you can judge whatever, her monetizing, you know, her story. But here's the deal. And people said to me last night on Facebook, you need to look her up and see this woman is, you know, whatever. I really don't, but I did. I looked up. And I saw that she was not trying to monetize. She was, I mean, the truth is, she, it looks like she was trying to hide the fact that she had had her child placed someplace else because she wasn't talking about it. And when people were asking about it online and going, where is he? You know, we, we enjoyed watching him. Where is he? Where has he gone? And they were persistent. 
And that's when she came forward and made a really stupid statement about rehoming him. What a stupid thing to say. Okay, we can be upset about that. We can be upset about the whole thing. But I'm saying, please don't vilify the fact that she said, I can't do this. Please, there are lives at stake, lots of lives at stake. So I'm asking you, have your feelings, have them, you know, I I would love to say to you, none of us should judge, but we all are, including myself. We're judging, but look at where your fear is. What is your fear? I feel like for a lot of us, our fear is that in moments like this, we go see people don't get it. And it's just us and our kids. And we got to protect them that much harder, right? (sighs) That's not entirely true. There's a lot of people who get it and a lot of people who care about our kids and would give their lives for our kids. But there are some people who aren't and we just got to we just got to look and know the difference, right? And, and I got to say, God bless the parent who is willing to say, yeah, tag out, I can't. But for the good of that child, I'm going to make sure that there was somebody who can. And from everything I hear, YouTuber mom did that and psycho mom didn't. They are not equal. They are not even. Feel free to be mad at me and say how much you dislike what YouTuber mom did but at least that kid is safe. And I understand that there's an emotional component to it. It's not great, right? But at least he's alive. Uh, Okay, that was my rant. Uh, I see that we're saying hello to Chaka. We're saying hi to Christina. We're saying hi to Anna and Michelle and uh, Sahas and Anna Marie. And um, I know somebody wrote in and said, my heart is breaking. My heart is broken, absolutely broken. Um, But I know that these things will continue. And we have to be adult. We have to look at them. And I just want to say, if there's anybody out there who feels like, man, I just don't think I can do this another day, please reach out. Please reach out. Don't harm yourself. Don't harm your child. Um, It's just not, that's not acceptable. Okay, um, so much going on, right? Uh, but we have Vince Redman who's going to be with us. I told you we're going to need a, uh, <laughs> a licensed family and marriage therapist to get through this. And, and these are not the only things going on in the world, but I know for the autism community, like sometimes things that are going on in the world that feel like, like what could we possibly, possibly do? Um, sometimes I feel so small in the world and feel like, man, you know, like, I wish I could fix that. And, and I just feel powerless. Um, so we, you know, I think as autism parents, we sort of move our, our, uh, like we're like lighthouses and we move our light and we go, here's this other thing. Okay. I'm going to focus all my energy on this one thing, um, that affects our community. Cause we feel like we have a little bit more traction there. Um, and it's what, it's been a bad week. It has been a bad, bad week, Um, but it's Friday and we have learned in this autism community, we're going to pick up and just keep on going because that is what we do. And we're going to love our kids and we're going to love our kids and we're going to love on them and their friends and other people in the community because that is what we do. And you know what? When we meet other people who love on our kids, we're going to appreciate them. And if there's one thing you can do today, that's you know, if there's somebody in your kid's life who's making a difference, who's not a part of your family or his extended family, reach out to them and say, God bless you. You're the kind of people that make me want to be on this planet because I know you get my, my kid. I know that you love my kid and you love them for who they are, not in spite of who they are, which is the greatest gift anybody can give anyone in this life. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. Okay, do we have Vince? Because <laughs> I need Vince. Is Vince with us? Uh, let's see if Vince is with us. Uh, hey, I'm sending big hugs to Paula too. Um, yeah, to, to my adoptive moms out there, right? Um, love to you guys. Um, 
because it's a big, big deal to put your heart out there and say that you're going to adopt a kiddo. And I know lots of adoptive parents who they would tell you, yeah, the origin story is that I adopted my child, but my child is my child. And, you know, you know, that's everything. Right. And I know that a lot of people looked at this story and said the fact that she rehomed that kid meant that she never got there with that kid. And I don't know if that's true or not, because I know lots of parents who have kiddos on the autism spectrum and they are their kids and they love them and they make the decision that their child is better off not in their home. And that is a thing, y'all. Um, so I hope that we don't like we don't know everything about this story. We don't. And just like when people give a child up for adoption and they go, this, I don't have the wherewithal to have a child. So I'm going to give this child to someone who can. That is an act of love. That is an act of courage and strength and bravery. And when an autism parent says, I can't do this, so I'm going to give them to somebody else. We have to look at it that way too. Yeah, she used the wrong words. And I don't know that, like, I've watched her stuff. I don't, I, I get the sense that she and I are never going to be close friends, right? Um, which is why I'm not saying her name, I'm not giving her any more attention for this. But, but in terms of what was right for that child, it is indisputable. The facts are there. That was not the home for that child. It wasn't. And he is someplace now that I understand that he has someone who absolutely adores the ground that he walks on and is someone who has a medical background, knows exactly what they're getting into, and that child is going to make great progress. Fingers crossed. Um, fingers crossed. Okay. Uh, so we don't have Vince yet. That's okay. Uh, what it, I want to know from you guys, what... Uh, disagree with me. Feel free to disagree agree with me. Tell me what you're feeling. Tell, tell me what you're mad about. Tell me what you're afraid about. Because we've, we've tossed a lot out there this morning. I'm just checking on to our other, um, to our live feature. I didn't even start at the beginning telling you guys how you could connect. You can connect with us right now through autism-live.com. You can also be connecting with us on Facebook Live, and we are on YouTube, Periscope, and Twitter at the moment. Okay. Um, I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, take a look at what Holly Robinson Pete had to say about mom number one. I have to be honest that like, I wasn't going to watch the video and I thought if I'm going to talk about this, I need to be able to talk about this and have as much information as I can have, right? It's unthinkable that she could do that to her child and do it not once, but twice. That's why I say she's, she's a psycho bag of whatever. And the fact that in this environment, that when she was trying to get the attention that she was trying to get and trying to get people to think that she was a victim, that she would, as a white woman, say that it was two black men is another layer for me in this environment that I cannot, I cannot. It is unthinkable to me. And on behalf, like, on behalf of every white woman, I am angry at her for that on top of everything else. Um, okay, uh, some big hugs. Uh, somebody says, uh, stepmoms to my oldest uh, with ASD. I raised my stepson since he was five. It was so hard, but I'm glad he is in my life. He is 26 now. Um, you know, we... I have a dear friend that I love who recently said, you know, we end up with a family that we're supposed to end up with. And I think that that's true. And sometimes you're with a family that you're not supposed to be with. And that's rough. That is really, really rough for everybody who has ever felt like they were in a family and they didn't belong there, right? When you finally found the family that you were supposed to be with. And sometimes that journey is long and hard. I know adults that are, you know, are still like, you know, finally now um, in their later years, finding the home that they're supposed to be with. And it's rough until you find them. And for children, it's just horrible, um, horrible for me. But I, I cling, cling to the fact that that little boy is where he is supposed to be now. And, and I also want to say that, you know, everybody was saying, you know, she's monetized, she's monetized, she's monetized. And, 
you know, people have said she should have to take down every post where uh, that includes him that that she monetized. Don't worry, like she's going to lose her sponsors for that. If that's really what you need, trust me, that's already in the works. Uh, somebody said I was terrified about uh, not being around my child when he grows up. He was three at the time and now he's almost five. I got to be honest, you know, um, I really have spent a great deal of time being afraid of uh, what would happen if I wasn't there for my child. And in fact, you know, um, I, it's my OCD went, cause my husband and I were almost in a car accident at one point when my son was probably five and um, no, he was, yeah, he just turned five and I got upside down. I got totally upside down. Now for me, that upside down meant that I couldn't drive my car and I didn't like being out of, out of my house. I had panic attacks if I was outside of my house. And I got, I got so far upside down that I had to do cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, I finally got to that pivotal, you know, we did weeks and weeks and weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy moves really, really slow up to a point. And then it's like, you have the breakthrough moment and then things are easier and better. And they're usually easier and better for the rest of your life. And I got through the breakthrough moment um, where I realized that the thing, I was trying to take control over everything and anything that I couldn't take control over, I wasn't participating in. And the breakthrough moment was when I said the words, I can't keep him safe. Even now, right? I was admitting the truth that my son was five years old and that I could do a bunch of things. I could, you know, move heaven and earth and do a bunch of things. And there, and still, I couldn't ultimately keep him safe because none of us can. When our children are out in the world, walking around and breathing, you know, it's that thing of your heart has this tether and your child is away from you. And you, you have to trust, you have to trust and you have to pull on whatever faith you have to know that your child is going to be okay. What I was able to do once I had that breakthrough was that, it, you know, becomes the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can. So I was able to look at it and go, I don't, I'm not able to keep him safe a hundred percent of the time, but here are the, you know, 3000 things that I can do to teach him safety. Here are the 3000 things that I can do to ensure that our home is as safe as possible. And here are the things that I can put in place for when I'm not here. <sighs> I know I really take a breath, right? Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that we all have a way of dealing with that. And I made the decision that um, I was going to make sets of godparents because there wasn't one person that I could leave my son to and say, I know that they'll be, they'll be okay and he'll be okay. And they'll be able to muster through this and they won't go, I can't do this. Um, I'm going to rehome him. Right. Uh, I decided that that was too much for one person. So uh, my husband and I made sure that there were, you know, uh, there's a, a family member that uh, she and her husband are, you know, the, the people who were designated to be responsible if anything happened to my son for his guardianship. But we thought of everything that we would want for him to do. And we went and got godparents for that. So for instance, we love theater and we wanted him to know about theater. And so we went and asked uh, friends of ours. Uh, one of them is uh, someone who's directed on Broadway and the other one is a brilliant playwright. And we said to them, will you please be his theater godparents? If anything happens to us, you are responsible for raising him in theater. And then we went to other friends who were lawyers and said, are, you're responsible for being the people that if he has a legal question or if there's something legal happening with him, you're up. Um, and, and these people may call you and we have ABA parents that if something's going on that they can call and reach out uh, to him. And we have, you know, spiritual godparents. We have all of that different stuff. Um, okay. Uh, to my friend who says, can't wrap my head around any of this, babe. All I know is that you're doing great work and I'm here if you need me. Thank you so much. I adore you. I know it's extra hard. Uh, for parents who have adopted to think of somebody, you know, and I know you guys are saying it's like giving a dog back. Um, but if your child needed something, 
If your child needed something right now and you knew for sure that you couldn't do it and someone else could, the only thing you would do is let them do that, right? Um, and, and that's what this is. Uh, someone else says it's almost every parent's nightmare. This is why it's so important for us to make our children as independent as possible. I don't want anyone to take advantage of my son. And so uh, I have been dedicated. It's, it's a very hard thing. Uh, I hear, I heard they put godparents on birth certificates now. Yes. And typically godparents are thought of as the people who are responsible for an individual's um, spiritual upbringing. And we just decided let's take that to every little pocket of life like who, who do we know is really good with finances? Like a series of experts that we have lined up for our son so that if he needs something, who's somebody that would give him a job no matter what? And we'll always have jobs available. Uh, you know, like who are the, so that it isn't, we, we tried to think of building a network instead of just thinking who, who would we leave him to? Now my kiddo is turning 17 uh, a week from today, a week from today. And so let me just tell you that I have in my head, uh, been thinking for the longest time. I have all this time. I have all this time. I have all this time. And now I'm like, I got a year. I got a year. He will graduate from high school and turn 18 on the very same day. And we made the decision many years ago, we sat down with him when he was a teenager and had a conversation with him and explained to him what conservatorship was. And we talked about what, what that decision would be based around because my son was cognitively at a place where he could have that conversation. And we talked to him about showing that he, that he had a few years to show us that he was responsible enough that that would not be a thing. And so we are in the very lucky position that we are not going, he will not be conserved in any way. So on that day, a year and a week from now, he will have total autonomy. And so I have a year to uh, have a say and to front load him with everything that I can possibly think of. And I won't be able to do it all. I won't. There will be things that he needs to learn on his own. And it, you're all going to have to hold my hand uh, because it's going to be very, very hard for me to let go. Uh, so there we have it. Um, I want to know for you guys, have you, I don't know where Vince is. Have we, uh, Traven, have you, I have not heard from him. And we need a license in marriage and family therapist, right? <laughs> like, honestly, uh, couldn't we use somebody like that? Uh, okay, I want to switch topics entirely. And I want to talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing next week. Uh, and then if Vince gets here, he might've been held up. Um, so next week on the show, we've got some really wonderful guests. On Monday, we're going to have Bonnie Yates, who's going to be with a special education attorney. And if you were here yesterday, Bonnie was talking to us, uh, and it's, you know, IEP season, and she's whoo, busy. Uh, but she mentioned, and a lot of you have been reaching out saying, I don't, we don't know what to do about the summer because we're not having extended school year. And what do we do? And we're in IEPs right now. And, you know, there's the potential right now to be asking for some compensatory education um, during the summer to make up for the time that they've lost in these last two and a half months, but also to make up for what they would have had for extended school year. And a lot of school districts are just, you know, they're they're like raising their shoulders and going, we don't know what we have available for you because we don't have things. So Bonnie had heard from another attorney about a service called Air Tutors. And these are people that do one-on-one -on -one tutoring online. And they're pretty much available on demand and they cover a wide ground of uh, things that they will tutor because they have tutors in different places that specialize in different things. So if you wanted test prep, and by the way, I called them yesterday. They are going to be on the show on Monday. So we're going to have Bonnie on the show. And then we're going to have uh, Hassan from Air Tutors is going to be with us on Monday morning. But I already had an opportunity to talk to Hassan. And I, at first glance, I'm really impressed uh, because they started this business because they were working with uh, an individual who had unique needs. Because so often we look at something and we go, well, that sounds like a great idea, but can they handle kids who have ADHD? Can they handle, handle kids who have autism? Can they handle kids that are, you know, uh, 
mirror, you know, five, can they handle them when they're 15? Like, what can they handle? And he seemed to think that he pretty much could handle anything you guys can throw at them. So I'm very excited about that. That's going to be on Monday. On Tuesday, we are going to, Tuesday is our day now that we're going to be featuring games and puzzles and things. And so we have a gentleman from Masterpieces Inc. who's going to be here with us talking about puzzles uh, because so many of you have taken to doing puzzles and these are unique puzzles. These are above and beyond puzzles. So we're going to we're going to tickle your fancy on Tuesday with some puzzles and we probably will squeeze in some meditation on Tuesday too, because we haven't been getting to it on Thursday. On Wednesday, Evelyn Kung is going to be here with us and she's going to be answering your questions on Thursday. You ready for this? Yadira Calderon is going to be with us. We've had her on the show before. She's an amazing mom. Uh, her site is the happy, Autism Happy Kingdom. And she has a daughter who's on the spectrum. And recently, Yadira lost her mother. And the process of watching her mother die and going through the grief and the paperwork and all of those things with her mother made her think about what will it be like for my daughter when I am gone and how will she process the grief? So we're going to talk about grief on the spectrum um, and how we prepare our kids for death and how we help them to deal with death. And we're gonna do that with Yadira. And then on Thursday, we're gonna have Courtney Tarbox. Does that name sound familiar to you? Yes, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But Courtney Tarbox is a wonderful professional in her own right and she specializes in ACT, acceptance commitment therapy. And she is gonna be doing a workshop coming up uh, the week after next about how to do ACT with our kids on the autism spectrum to help them to deal with their feelings and their anxieties. We've been waiting for this. Courtney's going to be with us on Thursday to tell us more about that. And then on Friday, we're back here. Nancy Oswald Jackson will be joining me and Tom Island will be here. And you know, Tom, he's a wonderful self-advocate and an international speaker. And he's got a lot to say about a lot of things that have been going on in the world that he wants to share with you. Um, and in particular about the rights and the needs of individuals on the spectrum during this COVID emergency. I hear that Vince is here. Vince, we need you more now than ever. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, that is my fault. I apologize. No, no, you're f How many times have we like messed up when we were going to meet with you? So do not, do not worry oh, at all. 100% but, me. I was waiting for Skype and then went, maybe she sent me a Zoom. And I looked and went, ah, that's I No, no, it's okay. Looking at my phone, uh, okay. I'm like, ah. No, 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 it's all okay. This is the first time we've had you on in this way then. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, welcome, welcome to our Zoom format. So Vince, to catch you up, we're so glad you're here because we, we never more have we needed a licensed marriage and family therapist than we have today. And I don't know if you got my message this morning that we were going to talk about this, but there were the two stories this week and I just went on a rant about them. And I really, I had asked Vince this morning, you guys, if we could talk specifically about the feelings that a parent goes through when they make a decision that their child would be better off and potentially make more progress not living with them. This is a very hard decision, um, but it is a decision that a lot of the parents need to make. Um, but there is guilt guilt, Vince. Um, and it is not being made easier by the fact that people are vilifying this mom um, that gave her child up. So I want to talk about that first, but then I want to talk about for the parents who are desperate and feel like they don't have a way out and are potentially thinking about doing something really horrible. And I feel like those are separate things, but help me if I'm wrong, Vince. Separate, but the same, right? I mean, it's part of the grief, part of the pain, part of the, the process that families go through. Now, extremes, for sure. We're talking about two yeah. extreme situations, but a lot in the middle, we share a lot of the same grief that these two families have gone through, the same struggles that they've gone through, um, the same you know, uh, uh, thoughts and, and disappointments and, and you know, sadness that they've that they've gone through or are currently going through, each have decided different ways to 
deal with that grief and situation, both very extreme and very, you know, uh, sad to, to see and to read overall. But the fact that they're going through it, I think it, it touches the heart of all of us, touches the heart of everyone who has uh, a special needs child and has lived through that grief and that disappointment and that the shock, you know, that they've gone through. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, so many times this week, I've, I've been thinking about the perspective taking. Mm -hmm. um, and we, you know, it's one of those things that they talk about endlessly that people on the autism spectrum are not good at perspective taking. And I got to say, Vince, I think that all of us need a refresher course in perspective taking. Absolutely. And it's not the same. It's not the same for any of us. And, uh, you know, I'll be the first person to say that, you know, I went through a period of time, I might've gone through two years, two and a half years, maybe even three years where my kid was, you know, kicking my can. I got punched in the head. I got bit. Um, there was a day when I thought that was the rest of my life. And I can, I can tell you how not okay it was. Right. Um, but I very quickly got help. Within a year of my child being diagnosed, I got help, big time help, where they were constantly showing me that he could learn, he could get better. And if I worked at things, they showed me a way out. Right. And it was everything to me because even on the hardest day, I was like, well, I'm, I guess I'm going to have to learn something new. But there are people who can take care of him. He can get better. I can do better at this. I don't know where we'll end up, but I saw hope at the end of the tunnel. I talk a lot of times to families who have not gotten there, that they feel like there is no hope. They feel like they can't get out. And I only know a snippet of what that feels like, a snippet of what it feels like. And I can't imagine how bad that must feel to feel like I'm not going to be able to do this. And like you said, we haven't, while we have maybe have similar boots, we have not stepped in their boots. We don't know what their dynamic is. We don't know what was going on in those families. We don't know what was going on in their lack of support. Maybe they weren't getting support. Maybe they weren't getting the professional guidance that you found and sought, right? It's not, while it's readily available, sometimes it's hard to find. We've all experienced that. We go to certain professionals and they guide us. Uh, you know, maybe a different way that doesn't lead us to hope. Maybe it leads us more to feeling that that we can't do this, or this is something that is is un, un you know un uh, uh, tolerable. And but we don't know that. But I want to be clear and keep saying it that hurting your child or anyone else's child is never okay. Never. There's never excuse for it. There's never a, well, mitigating factors. No, no. it's against the law. It's morally uh, inconceivable mm -hmm. and it isn't okay. And That's we true. and we, we can say that somebody was mentally ill, but that is not an excuse mm -hmm. for har harming or killing someone. Right. I just wanna be clear about that because people, you know, they'll go, well, are you getting wishy-washy on this? No. Oh, no, 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 not at all. It's, it's like you said, it's understanding that the pain and the, and the, the suffering that they are going through, that the, pa the parents are going through. That's not a, a reasonable, rational uh, or an acceptable result. The, the, the one family that uh, uh, I can't even say it. It's hard, hard to even I know. say, right? Um, I know. But it does ring bells to the professional communities that there's families out there that need support. There's families out there that need that hope, that need that faith, that need to be led to support so that they can be helped, not just the child, but the family as well, yeah. you know, in, in dealing with their suffering, their grieving, their thought process. Cause you know, let's be honest, obviously the thought process wasn't rational and wasn't, wasn't something that was leading to positive and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, effective decisions. But on the flip side, mm -hmm. in many cases, we see that a child cannot remain and shouldn't remain with their family. Right. For instance, you know, the child is 17 years old and, and he is big and he, you know, when he has tantrums, he, you know, he has a small mom and he hurts her. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. right? That child, it is better for that child to not be at home. And in fact, Vince, we see that sometimes when that child goes to another home, that the incidences of the punching reduce, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it's not the mom's fault, but if you physically can't get to the point where you can defend yourself, then that person is going to hit more and they're going to get more of a reinforcer for it. And it's not going to go away. Now, that's not your fault, but it's not the best environment for the child to be in. And there's hundreds of other examples of why it is best for someone to not stay with their residential family. Absolutely. What do you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, Vince, what do you say to the, because I know I can list at least on one hand, five moms that are currently in a position where everyone, the experts, um, you know, their family, even themselves, they admitted, have admitted to themselves that their child is not doing as well as home as they would someplace else, but they can't get over the guilt hump. They can't get over it. They're like, I feel like, who am I if I'm not the person taking care of my child? And why can't I do it? I should just get better. And it's killing them. What do you say to those moms? That you are taking care of your child. That is what you're doing. You are taking care of your child. You're putting them in the environment that is they're going to thrive in, that they're going to do better in, that they're going to improve in. It, it, it be another residence, it be a, a residential placement, it be a hospitalization. You are actually caring for your child by doing that. Right. Knowing our limitations as parents is huge. Knowing our limitations in sometimes just like you were mentioning, sometimes it's just our physical limitations. Right. You have a 17 year old, 6'3, 250 pound, you know, son that could be very dangerous because we can't out physical them. And so we need to put them in an environment where that doesn't work anymore, that they can't use their aggression, use their size to be able to manipulate and get, uh, you know, whatever they want or wherever they are. But to me, to parents, and I've, and I've worked with families for this for years, that is the first thing I say to you is you are exactly helping your child by doing this because you're putting them in an environment, you're giving them the resources, you're giving them the hope, you're giving them the professionals that are there to help you, that are able to help them akin to taking your child to the hospital right if your hospital if your child was very sick or had broken bones or you know uh, uh was in an accident we take them to the hospital so that the professionals are there to take care of them right yeah. and that would be a similar analogy is we're taking them to the professionals in a in an environment in which they will be helped i feel like vince that part of the reason why people are so mad um and believe me, I have my emotions too about this mom who I hate the language that she used that she rehomed her four year old child on the autism spectrum. And I think one of the reasons why people are so mad is because it's a small child. And, and so they feel like she, I presume, I mean, I've, I've heard people who have said, you know, she shouldn't have given her child up. Um, and it isn't something that we see frequently where a, uh, a parent of a small child says, look, the autism is too much. And so I'm going to place my child in a different environment, but we do see it sometimes. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know uh, what you can say about this, but it, it's like, for me, if, if somebody has gotten to the point where that's what they're looking at, it seems a no brainer to me that that is a much better solution than letting it fester because even if they don't harm the child, emotionally they're harming the child because I think children can tell when they're not, when somebody doesn't wanna be with them, when they're a burden. Even a four year old with autism can tell when they're not wanted. Am I crazy? No, you're exactly right. And the thing is, I think the, the, the big outcry is because this was done on a social media stage. Right. This actually happens a lot more than people know because it's done with professionals in a in a way where the child's taken care of, the family's taken care of, they're placed, you know, somewhere where they're they're going to be cared for and they're going to, you know, they're going to be able to to thrive as they continue to age. I think the outrage right now is because it's now been done on, you know, by social media influencers on a social media stage. But you're right. We have to look at these situations. What is what is best for that situation? Now, again, I don't know this family. I don't know what they did or didn't do, but I agree with you. I feel that 
if they know their limitations and they know this is something they're not going to be able to provide the time, the effort, you know this more than anyone, the time, the effort, the patience, the practice that they're going to need to do to have their child survive, to have their child thrive, to have their child uh, continue to progress and, and, and reach all their goals, it is better for that child and for them to have someone else that can do that for them. Right. Yeah. I want that child to be successful and we want them to be successful. And if that's what they need to do, that's best for the child. Yeah. I think with a lot of families, if they're having intense issues with a four year old, you know, and again, this does happen. It's not that it's never happened before, but it's never been so much in the public eye before. But I think the typical thing is if we're having this many problems with a four-year-old that more experts come in, maybe the child is taken out of the home for a period of time, but the ex- expectation is the child will come back to the home. Um, and they, you know, another family, but I have seen it. I've actually seen it before where the child went out of the home to go be with someone else, to be able to get intensive care because the family was not able to provide it because there were so many children in the home and the parents were working and so on and so forth. But that ultimately everyone decided that the child was doing so much better in the other place that everyone stayed involved in the child's life, but the child did continue to live with the other family. And eventually they became the legal guardians to the family because it worked. It made more sense. It was better for the child. Um, And that the child was doing better. That was it. The child was doing better. The parent did what they had to do, even though it probably broke their heart but the child was better and that made it worth it. And that's what made the parents say, I'm still involved, I'm still a part in their life. He's doing well, let's keep that going, right? But that parent stayed involved. That parent stayed involved in that treatment. They stayed involved and saw that it was working, which is, you know, again, a different version of, of sometimes having, you know, having the child in a different environment is beneficial. And you can do that without losing the relationship, without losing the bond, without losing the active participation in their lives. Yes, I feel that part of parenting is that forever, there is gonna be a piece of yourself that is gonna put another human being before your own wishes, hopes, and desires. That's what I personally feel like parenting is. That there's always gonna be a piece of you that is going to put their welfare Um, at least on a par with yours, if not above, you know, I know that you are an amazing dad, Vince, and I know that there's nothing that you wouldn't do for your girls. And that sometimes as a parent, we have to make tough decisions that our kids don't like. Sometimes we have to do something for them. That's hard in the, in the long runs. I've, I've been learning about letting my child grow up, which means that sometimes I have to let him stumble and fall so that he learns. I could do it for him. And it would be easier, um, but then he doesn't learn. So there's lots and lots and lots of tough decisions in life. But if we always put it through that lens and go, what's best for the child? Mm-hmm. Staying with the parent is not always the best decision. And ultimately, when the kids get older, frequently, it is not the best decision. Right, right. And again, it's looking at each case in each situation and each dynamic differently, Right. It's not a one size. I think what you're saying is it's not a one size fits all, right? We love children. We love, you know, we dedicated our lives to not only our own children, but to, you know, the thousands, if not more, you know, children around the world. We love children, but we can't say that's the same case for every family, for every dynamic and for every situation, because there's so many variables. So I love what you were saying is that, you know, what's best for the child could be that, I mean, that's very wide open. What's best for them could be a number of things, even if it doesn't agree with what we would do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if I lived in a perfect world and I could hit rewind Mm -hmm. and we could go back in time and let's start with the mom who, uh, you know, is the the YouTuber. Um, Because if there's a parent who's out there who has a four-year-old and they're having a really hard time, what would we say to that parent about like what resources could we give them to help them either to keep the the child at home or to help them to get through the difficult process of saying, 
I can't do this. What would we say to that parent to help them in their process? The first thing is looking at immediate, some type of immediate relief for them. In some of it, it may, might be just talking to them about hope, showing them research, showing them all the great stuff that's now available to them, right? I mean, different than 10 years ago when a lot of this stuff wasn't as readily available to families, showing them the accessibility to treatment, showing them the results, showing them, you know, uh, different resources for family care, individual care, right? Really showing them the support network that's with them. So maybe they can take a big sigh and say, okay, I'm not alone. I do have people around me and professionals around me that will help me and, and will show me that hope, show me that guiding light, right? My first thing with every family is to try to make that immediate connection, try to make that immediate, you're not alone. There are a ton of resources that I am going to connect you with. Not here, go find them. I'm going to connect you with them. I'm going to connect you with social group or support groups, with professionals in ABA, professionals in psychology and counseling, whatever their family needs. So then this way we're guiding them rather than them leading. They don't know where to go, right? So I want to be the light for them. I want to give them the support, show them the support. And going back to what you're saying, then that little bit of hope is our seed. And how do we grow the seed? Then that's continually working with the family, continually working with the child, start making progress, meeting goals, seeing changes um, you know, made in front of their eyes. Now that seed grows into a, a full, you know, a full flower of hope. Yeah. And then, you know, for the families that are, you know, sometimes I'm so afraid that people are too far gone to hear, but if somebody is out there and they are depressed mm -hmm. and they feel that there's no way out. And, um, and they are having thoughts about hurting themselves or their children, Vince. What do we tell them? They need to reach out. You're not alone. You are absolutely not alone. You need to reach out to someone. You need to reach out to, you know, first if family members and family. If, if there's anyone that you trust, reach out to them and talk to them. If you feel there's not, you feel that that's too intimate or there's, there's not anyone around, maybe you moved or, or were displaced into an area that you don't have family and friends, reach out to a professional, reach out to someone who will help you, right? There's lots of support groups, lots of uh, therapy options, no matter where we're at. If you're not sure of, of any, you can reach out to us. You can reach out to um, your, your local mental health services, county mental health services. They're able to guide you to different supports. My biggest thing is do not try to do it alone. You need yeah. the support. You need someone to bounce things off of. You need someone to hold on to and let them guide you. Yeah. I think it's extra hard in this COVID emergency to be able to get a hold of officials and to get like, to, you know, you call a friend and say, can you come over and be with my child? But because of COVID, it's that much harder. And, you know, but there is, you know, last ditch effort there, you know, every state here in the United States has uh, a child welfare department, um, you know, call 911 and ask for them. Um, do what you have to do to keep yourself and your child safe. I wish that just like we learned years ago that there has to be a safe haven drop off for newborn babies that, that a mother can't take care of right? That they can just drop off. There's no recriminations, whatever. I wish that there was a safe haven respite in every hospital for um, children and teens and adults with autism, that if the caregiver is not capable, that they could, with no recriminations, drop their child off at a hospital and say, I need, I need some respite. I need some help. I need some support. And that there would be, you know, the child would be taken and taken care of for whatever period of time. And that there were psychologists and officials that could help that individual and determine, can this child go back to this parent or does this child need to be someplace else for a period of time? Or does this child need to be someplace else forever? Because unfortunately, I think until we do that, we are going to have situations like we've seen this week. Right. Um, where there is a loss of life. And, and this is your last, your last response, right? You, you have those professionals, you have 911, you have social services to come and help you and maybe even remove the child from, from you know, if that's yeah. where you're at, if that's the place you're at, they will take care of your child and they will find a place for them so that you can care for yourself. It's yeah. never too late. It's never too late. And there's always services there to help you. 
even at your your most you know vulnerable state state you still have 911 and welfare welfare services to yes. come and help you and help your child you're never yes. you're never alone and anything is better than what the mom did um who killed her child anything anything yeah. is better um, unfortunately, Vince, we're out of time, but thank you so much for being the voice of rationality because I certainly needed it this morning and we really appreciate you. I hope that you have a great, great weekend. I want to say to everybody, I hope that for our world and for our country that we can begin to heal with all the things that are going on right now. I encourage you if you need some help and support to reach out, to get somebody to talk to. There's so much going on right now and you're having feelings. We're all having feelings. Um, you don't have to have them alone. Um, Vince gave you some great resources and, and we will hope for a better week next week. Uh, and again, just asking for any, anybody out there, include our good friend, Joanne Lara in your prayers. Thank you so much for being with us, Vince. Thank you. We'll again, be back on late. Monday. I'm sorry, what were you saying? Again, sorry, I was late. Oh, no, no, you're fine. Uh, we'll be back on Monday. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.